Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call the meeting of the Maryland State Farmers Association Executive Committee for March 19th to order. I would ask that Chaplain Long give the invocation and the pledge to the flag. Before we get started, please remember to keep the Davis family in your prayers. Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to, to serve the, the fire service across the state of Maryland. Father, we ask you for the wisdom and knowledge needed to do the business of this association. Father, we ask you to watch over those who are not with us who are sick and protect and guide those who are serving on the calls of today as calls come in. Father, we ask you to bless this meeting, bless all those who are serving. I guess it's all in your name. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, Thank you. Please be seated for the welcoming address. President McRae and the president of the Boldy Scooters Volunteer Fire Company, John Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to see everybody's smiling face with, you know, without a mask. Very good, thank you. Uh, also, I want to uh, thank our host, Police Quarters, and um, for the hospitality and for the delicious uh, breakfast this morning. So, John? Welcome to Bullish Quarters. Good morning. Hey, you are awake. There you go. I'm John Hammond. I'm the president here for my fifth term, by the way. Anything you need while you're here in Bullish Quarters, let me know. Our hall manager, Rick Fisher, his wife, Brenda, or any of the staff in the kitchen would be glad to help you out. Whatever you need, we'll provide it. Our hall here, we trade as Lighthouse Gardens, so if you ever see that, uh, come across the web page or something. Uh, we have events here. We got a bull roast coming up this coming Saturday. If anyone's interested, we still have tickets. It's bull shrimp and oyster. A little brief history, real quick, of Bullish Quarters. This is our 77th year in existence. Started out in a little one car garage about a mile down the road from here, which is still there. And now we're here in what you see. Um, this was actually the old engine house at one point. Then we put an addition on the front of this, moved the engines out there. Then we have the building across the street is now the new engine house. And the little house next to that, we affectionately call that the beach house. That's our training rooms, our bunk rooms, kitchen, that sort of thing. We love spending time in the beach house. I gotta put the glass on. I can't see. I'm gonna make this quick. I'd like to invite you to visit our history bay. It's right out the door here along this wall, right behind the AV equipment out there is our 19, uh, 1947 Mac. It was our original engine, and there's uh, pictures on the wall of our entire history. We started out with a Packard automobile with a trailer, and we've gone up to one Pierce Enforcer engine, one heavy rescue squad, one high water rescue vehicle, which is over here in the parking lot. We're also the home of Marine Emergency Team 21 because we are surrounded by water. We started out with a wooden rowboat, and now we have three state-of-the-art marine units for fire, rescue, and medical calls on the water with it, around 15 rescue swimmers. Uh, I will have our large boat, Marine Unit 219, at Long Beach Marina for the ladies' luncheon at Bowley's on the Bay. Those of you that are interested in going to that, Susquehanna Avenue is on this side of the building. Go down Susquehanna Avenue two blocks and make it right on Chester Road. You'll run right in the gate. Anybody would like to come down and see the fire rescue boat? It has a landing craft door. Hopefully the tide's good. We can walk right on and uh, take a look at the rescue boat. Like I said, we are surrounded on three sides by water. we got Seneca Creek on this side, Chesapeake Bay over here, and Middle River on this side. We are prone to high tide, so if your feet start getting wet, don't worry about it. Just prop your feet up on a chair, and in about an hour, it'll be gone. <laughs> it's 
say I woke you up with a little joke. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, recognition by uh, Second Vice President Eric Smothers. Announcement of who is here. And while Eric's making his way to the microphone, a couple ground rules for today and tomorrow. We have an acting secretary, Mr. Jonathan Dayton, who is typing and writing quickly. However, everything is being recorded. Therefore, if you have something to say, you need to be in front of one of these microphones. Chairs are set up out front for your seating. There is a, a live mic there. Everybody speaks into the mic and identifies himself, please. Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to run down the list. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, get back in the land of the living, so to speak. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Going around state and traveling and uh, Seeing everybody's faces, uh, I know I'm looking forward to uh, when we can all get together in Ocean City, uh, and certainly getting around back out to the association meetings and, and so forth. Um, you know, moving, moving forward, and the state's moving forward. Uh, I, I think we're in a good, good spot. Uh, so I appreciate that. So for that, let's see if I missed you as I was trying to go around just uh, pull something at me. Trust me, I won't shoot back. Um, got the President Joel McCray, Ben Kurtz, second, or First Vice President, Second Vice President myself, Secretary Joel Cox, uh, Treasurer Ron Sonke, Assistant Treasurer Fred Cross, and um, Assistant Treasurer Bob Jacobs. Uh, Financial Secretary uh, Mitch Vaki. Uh, Assistant Financial Secretary uh, Barbara Aaron, Chief Chaplain John Long, Parliamentarian Ken Bush, our Executive Director Kate Lovelace, Executive Assistant Ben Hawkins. Is anybody? Uh, our Executive Committee, looks like everybody's here Doug, Doug Simpkins, Steve Cox. Timothy Blackston, Ron Block, Mr. Skip Carey, Timothy Dayton, Jim Jewell, Lee Lutz, Robert Phillips, Charlie Simpson, Dan Stevens, Buddy Sutton, and Chuck Walker. That's it. For our past presidents, I have uh, Mr. Bob Cumberland, Tom Mattingly, Bernie Smith, Red Ross, um, Steve uh, Cox, Gene Worthington, Sir uh, Robert Jacobs, Paul Sterling, Frank Underwood, Danny, Dan Lewis, Dave Lewis, uh, Dave Keller, Mark Bilger. Blair, Faust, uh, Chuck is here. Is this anybody there on that list? Okay. So we are on our executive committee. I have Doug Alexander, our chairman. Partner so far this morning, I have uh, Brian Geraci, our state fire marshal, Jeffrey, um, Mr. Michael Kopp, uh, Mark Belger is here for MIMS, and I haven't seen anybody else this morning. And for Chairpersons for our executive committee for uh, um, committees are Joel Cox for our awards, Budget Review, Steve Cox, Constitution and Bylaws of Garrett, Convention, Ron Sarnke, EMS is Charlie Simpson, Federal Legislators is Mr. Bob Cumberland, Vice President, 
fire walls, and smart filter, fire, per fire prevention, Tree San Christman, Grants, David Lewis, Hall of Fame, Richard Smith, Center Program, Rick Hemphill, 17 State Circle, Frank Underwood, NBSC, Dave Lewis, Out of State Coordinator, Bob Cumberland, uh, President's Vehicle, Steve Cox is here, uh, Public Relations, Ronald Watkins, Recruitment and Retention, Jonathan Dayton, Risk Management, Chip Jewell, Robert Scheimer Award, Bob Jacobs, Sergeant at Arms, Four Woods, Transportation, Wayne Tim, Volunteer Trumpet, Jonathan Dayton, Ways and Means, Mitch Fox, Wills uh, and Heroes Program, Mike Farlow. Did I miss any other committee chairs? And then we also have a special guest with us this morning, Ms. Uh, Kelly Schultz, who is uh, also running for governor for the state of Maryland. Kelly, I'll turn it over to you if you want to get a few words. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to be really loud. Can everybody hear me in the back? All right. Very cool. My name is Kelly Schultz, and I'm running to be our next governor of the state of Maryland. Hi, Chip. It's, uh, I'm from Frederick County, so it's really great to see some of my, uh, my neighbors here. And what a beautiful hall to be able to have this in today. But I want to talk to you just very briefly about why I'm running for governor and why it's important for each and every one of you uh, to be able to continue to move forward. In the state of Maryland, we have to make sure that we stay on a path. Over the course of the last seven years, we've been able to do remarkable things, but I also want to be able to make sure that we continue on what we have done. For the past seven years, I have worked with Governor Hogan and his cabinet. I was the Labor Secretary for four years. I was the Commerce Secretary for three years until I decided to do this campaign full time. Prior to that, I represented my district in Frederick County and also am a member of the Walkersville Volunteer Fire Company. Um, I don't know, I didn't see if anyone's here from Walkersville today, but I do see some Frederick County friends. And I understand the importance of being able to make sure that we are safe, steady, and prosperous as we continue on to the next path of where we need to go in the state of Maryland. And safety is my number one issue. Being able to make sure that we have the resources to be able to make sure that our families are safe because with our families being safe, nothing else matters other than the safety of our families in our community. And each and every one of you in this room are a part of that. I tell, you know, kind of a simple story. I'm a, I'm a grandma, I have a, a little seven month old grandbaby and uh, he needed medical service. Um, emergency about a month ago and the New Market Volunteer Fire Company was out there in less than five minutes in order to be able to service my grandson. For each and every one of you for what you do to be able to make all of us safer and better, I appreciate that and to be able to make sure that when we move into the next four years that we keep understanding that the criminals are the criminals and the police force and our volunteer fire for it, fire, firefighters are the heroes. And that's what we have to be able to make sure that every single community across the state understands. We also have to make sure that our educational system is where we need for it to be for our young families. And I'm gonna be out there every single day talking about the Parents' Bill of Rights. I issued this Parents' Bill of Rights about six weeks ago, wanting to make sure that every parent understands that they have a responsibility and a right in order to be able to make sure that their child has the best education that they are supposed to be getting in this state. And that comes with accountability and it comes with transparency. And we're gonna fight for that. But we're also going to fight for that because everybody has the obligation to be able to look at what it means to be our personal best. And that's about prosperity. And prosperity is something that each and every one of us can have. Regardless of the zip code of where we live, we want to be able to make sure that each and every Marylander is there. When I was 20 years old, I was a new mom. I dropped out of college. I got married. I had my two babies. 
and I spent the next 15 years of my life raising my kids and doing everything that I could in order to be able to take care of them and to provide for our family. I waited a lot of tables, I tended a lot of bar, I worked hard in order to be able to make sure that the opportunities were there. We have to continue to make sure that the opportunities are here in Maryland for all of our families, especially those hardworking families that are living paycheck to paycheck. And what we have right now with the inflation tax, which I call the gas tax, because it is tied to inflation, that was thanks to a good friend of ours named Martin O'Malley back in 2013. I voted against that bill for a major reason because Marylanders, hardworking Marylanders, were fighting every single day in order to be able to keep money in their pocket as opposed to having money being spent to the government even more so than what it was. But we have to repeal that. I will repeal the inflation tax the first year that I am governor, just like Governor Hogan repealed the rain tax the first year that he was governor. And then the other prosperity issue that I'd like to talk about is a really important issue for this community as well and it's the retirement tax. Maryland is one of the only states in the nation that has the retirement tax at the level of what it is. And that retirement tax coupled with the estate tax means that Marylanders cannot afford to live in Maryland after retirement. And we see that every single day. We have, I can't tell you how many people I talk to on the phone who's answering their phones from Florida or North Carolina or South Carolina or Delaware because it's cheaper to live there but here's the thing, we all earned our pensions here in the state of Maryland. We should be able to stay in the state of Maryland to be able to enjoy our retirement with our families, with our children. And specifically for those of you in this room, being able to extend the LOSAP to be able to make sure that we increase the amount of tax credits that you get for doing the volunteer service that each and every one of you do. And I appreciate that. There is a fine line between career firefighters and volunteer firefighters, and I respect every single one. And the fact that you are here today means that it is your, it's, it's your mission in order to be able to create this public service to the Marylanders across the state. And I thank you for that. And as your next governor, I will be able to make sure that you are taken care of in a way that you all deserve to be taken care of. And my greatest respect to each and every one of you. So thank you very much, I appreciate you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, at this time, I'll go into the officers' reports. Uh, President Joel McRae. Good morning again, everyone. And uh, thank you for being here. As Kelly Schultz said, just being here shows um, your commitment to the success of this organization and to what we can do for our members. Uh, matter of fact, I, I truly believe that there is a renewed uh, energy within the MSFA. As a matter of fact, uh, the president of all these quarters pulled me aside this morning and said, you underestimated the number of people that were going to attend this morning. And I think that's a good thing. And uh, you had to go and get, get more food to accommodate, but it's great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, just a little housekeeping uh, reminder, if you can turn your phones on vibrate, uh, so they don't go off or else the Betsy Marshall Fund is, is going to thank you. Uh, this weekend, this, this will be a very full weekend. There will be a lot of information presented. There will be a lot of discussions. Uh, this weekend, the good things I hope we hear about is the advancements being made on our recruitment and retention front. And the initiatives that this organization, uh, in conjunction with our partners, has taken to address the mental wellness of our members. Now everyone knows this is a busy time of the year for the legislative committee. And I, I want to tell you, it's not possible to appreciate what this committee does unless you spend time in that office. They put in a tremendous amount of work there every day, early in the morning to late in the evening. Uh, and now with double sessions, it's getting even later. Uh, th this committee has, has just done uh, a yeoman's job, not only with what they do normally, but being able to navigate the ever-changing rules and requirements that are imposed by the legislature. You know, we started off this year not being able to get into the houses, everything done uh, virtually, all testimony done virtually. Uh, if you got in, everything was masked. I mean, it was, and, and requirements for how the testimony gets submitted, 
I, I commend you on being able to navigate that those rules. This is just phenomenal. Now, while the MSFA has not been able to hold an in-person convention for the past two years, uh, the uh, convention committee, I think, has done a fantastic job with some very creative thinking to make these conventions work, to get the business of the association done. And I commend you on that. Well, the good news is we are planning for an in-person convention in June, as we all know. And given the time that has passed, I am being told that this planning process is like starting all over again. Now, I think they, um, we, we have learned a great deal over the past couple of years about how we can probably do things better. And now the challenge is to incorporate those ideas of what worked over the past two years with an in-person convention. And we will hear more about that uh, as we move forward. Also, I'd like to point out that we will have some excellent education, education opportunities offered at the Ocean this year, uh, thanks to our Executive Director, Kate Lovitz. This weekend, we will also hear about the name changes that will be on the ballot. But given that there have been multiple name changes submitted by our member companies, it's clear, it's a clear indication that many of our members think it's time to recognize the change in demographics of this association. And remember, the mission of the Maryland State Fire Association is clear. It has not changed. It is to serve, promote, advocate, and represent the interests of the volunteer, fire, rescue, and emergency medical services in Maryland. Now, being the time of the year, um, this is a good time of the year for the banquets. Uh, and with the uh, restrictions in the COVID, the reduction in the restriction uh, of the COVID um, being lifted. Many more companies are holding the banquets. Uh, Barb and I thank you for the invitations and want to tell you that we have thoroughly enjoyed the banquets that we have attended. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our friend and past president, Danny Davis. It was a great loss um, with him, with, with his death. I have to commend Southern Maryland. They did an excellent job with the uh, viewing and the service and then the um, services the next day. But with the death of Danny Davis, it does leave some voids and some vacancies within our organization. And I'd like to address one of those today. The Budget and Revenue Committee um, would like to let you know that Gene Kerfman has been now moved up to vice chair. And John Nelson, the seventh district in St. Mary's, will fill the rest of the term of Danny on the budget committee. Again, I thank all the officers and committees for what you do for this association and its members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. First Vice President Ben Kurtz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. President McRae, Second Vice President Smothers, officers and members and guests of the MSFA. Since our last executive committee meeting, three presidents have traveled to various county and regional associations until once again COVID hit us during the holidays, making it either canceled or virtual meetings similar to what we had in 2020. The Convention and Conference Committee is committed to provide a convention and conference, one that we will remember for our 130th anniversary. Several changes, including the completion of Sea Hall for those of us who were able to go down to Ocean City and view the new Sea Hall for our convention and conference. With these changes in the program, also, with the courtesy of Ken Bush and, and Kate, our seminars and classes will be educational as well as informative. To the MSFA Legislative Committee, once again, kudos for busy reviewing a mountain of bills submitted in both the House and Senate. And Bob and Richard, thank you for guiding me through to uh, go online 
submitting my testimony. Uh, you had a lot of patience, Bob, that's all I can say. But thank you. These two gentlemen helped me uh, submit it in the proper and open up an account for future use. In January of 2022, after discussions with the three presidents and a teleconference with the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association, their leadership, we have created a joint mental wellness task force. I've appointed Teresa Christman as the chairperson. The personnel from both the MSFA, the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association, as well as our allied partners in MIFRI and MIMS in various CISM training throughout the state membership to assist us. The task force, I've given them goals and objectives as long as also of setting up their own mission statement. We're looking forward of putting into awareness classes throughout the state and each region of making mental wellness something that everyone can be educated on, whether it's for our providers or whether it's for our family members to assist them. There will be classes put on at the convention and conference this June. We're also looking into resources for funding seminars, counseling sessions, and classes. It's a fantastic group. We've had a Zoom meeting. Uh, the one last month had to be postponed, but we're having one March 21st. And I'm sure Teresa will go into more in-depth about the task force and our meeting coming up on Monday. Thank you for your support. I'm looking forward to the year ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Second Vice President Eric Smothers for his report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. officers, members of our association, uh, I bring you greetings from uh, Dakota County. Um, there's not much more to be said from what our, the, our president and first vice president has said. We're coming back to life and move, moving forward. We have a, a lot of good initiatives on, on the table and looking for group support as we move forward with those initiatives, particularly the crisis management. That's a huge game changer, I think, for us. Um, we've had enough uh, line of duty deaths here, and not only here in, in Maryland, but also suicides and so forth. And um, we know the burdens that it takes for our members of our departments when they're struggling at, at home, and not just here in the fire service, but maybe also in their personal lives. Um, when we lose one member, that's one too many. I take my hat off to the partner agencies that have joined us to work uh, with this CISM initiative moving forward. Um, and I look forward to working with each and every one of them. Um, my hats go off to all of our members that have, over the last two years, that have reconstituted themselves within their own departments, particularly our auxiliary members. Uh, I, I always say that there's these men and women are kind of the unsung heroes of our backbone of our fire departments, the things that they do and how creative they keep the monies coming into the departments and uh, the, the issues and the challenges that they face, uh, as well as some of our cadets. I uh, had the opportunity to talk to a few folks la last night. Um, and their initiative and drive to get into these training classes um, across the state. Um, my hat's off both MIMS and Memphrey for keeping that light on 
um, during this pandemic. Uh, it, it's tough for adults, so it's even tougher for kids when they got to do virtual learning. So we, we feel your pain on both, both sides of that coin. Um, but sticking with it, the leadership of the departments, my hats go off to you for not uh, leaving those folks behind and being creative and continuing to show up for classes. Um, I know I'm looking forward to us meeting in o Ocean City. Uh, I think it'll be a good time. The convention committee is working hard um, to bring us back to life. There. Um, the legislative committee, uh, my hat goes off to you men and women that have worked with that group uh, in, in Annapolis. Uh, stellar work uh, down there to keep track of all the initiatives and keeping us surprised of what, what's going on. Um, so hopefully we'll have a good two days here with some good discussion and I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Our executive director, Kate Loveless, in the bullpen, ready to come up. Secretary Doral Cox. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Executive Committee, uh, members of the MSPA, and guests. Uh, good morning. Oh, okay. Should I yell? I have a big mouth. Yell. <laughs> oh, just keep talking? Okay. Um, so my report's been electronically submitted. You all should have it, um, and it's listed online in the members area section. Uh, the MSFA staff has continued the daily work of the MSFA through many avenues. Uh, we've been working diligently on the weekly reporting that you all should be getting, um, tax submissions, safer grant project tasks, and most recently the classroom seminars and exhibit coordination uh, for this year's convention and conference. Uh, I'll just briefly skim through the report. Um, you all should have a copy in front of you as well. Uh, the safer grant. Uh, since December, which was when we were awarded the grant and the grant began, two of the three regional coordinators have been filled. Uh, so it's my pleasure to announce our Southern Maryland quarter coordinator, who's Dale Bowen. He's here in the background. Okay. And uh, our Eastern Shore coordinator is Tracy Johnston, who is the communications lieutenant at the Queen Anne's County DES. Um, she's actually working today. She couldn't get the day off. We only just hired her last week. So. Uh, we hope to have Tracy with us in June. Um, and she's also a member of, member of the Southern Nevada Review Park of Park Finance County. Um, in the report is Dale's email as well as Tracy's. And we also have with us today our full-time recruitment retention coordinator and safer program manager, Heather Gorski. Heather, she's right there with Dale. So they're here if you have any questions for anyone today regarding safer. Um, we're still kind of getting our feet wet only three months into the grant, so uh, any questions or uh, potential projects that you may be interested in or that we can help with, please let us know. Uh, we also have one individual uh, that submitted their resume for the remaining Western Maryland quarter coordinator position, so we'll be interviewing that individual next week. Uh, we have our 2022 recruitment boot camp next weekend. We're excited to announce that there's over 115 attendees registered. Uh, we had to move from Mifri to the uh, Branchville Volunteer Fire Department in Prince George's County just to accommodate the numbers. Uh, we thought we were gonna be able to do a live Zoom link, but because of the logistics within the building and the Wi-Fi, we were not gonna be able to do it live, but we will have it recorded. So all of the speaker presentations will be available for later viewing, uh, and we'll have that up and on the website as soon as the event is over. Uh, we also have a post-event report that will be available in mid-April. We're asking that all county recruitment and re retention coordinators contact Heather and give them her information so we have a streamline of who the people in the counties are that we need to discuss recruitment and retention efforts with. Um, once the boot camp's complete, Skip, Heather, and I, we will begin working with our vendor on the first steps in the creation of the MSFA mentorship program. Uh, that will be a statewide program along with an online marketing platform that will assist volunteer departments in keeping the members that they have and uh, bringing on new members and gaining, uh, gradually getting them through the process without losing them. Uh, our statewide recruitment open house weekend is April 23rd and 24th. It was moved back uh, simply because of the Easter weekend. 
Uh, I don't want to take too much more of Jonathan's thunder as he's the recruitment and retention chair. So, um, but any questions regarding those events, please let myself or Heather know. Uh, and in the report it says we'll continue working with the recruitment and retention committee on all our uh, safer projects and the Maryland Fire Chiefs on promoting their plan leadership training. Uh, the weekly report that continues to be sent out weekly, if we skip a week it's because nothing has really changed and I don't want to inundate people with emails that with information that doesn't change. But for the most part anything that updates throughout the week is sent out to the executive committee members the officers and anyone else who has asked to receive that report. So if you're interested in that report and want to see the important news and updates, uh, please let me know and I can add you to the list. I've also started sending the weekly reports to Greg Malin, so they will be listed on the website as well under uh, the members area. Uh, convention and conference, we're going to come up with Ron later and give some more updated details on what we've been working on. Um, we have had a request from uh, MDEM or MEMA uh, requesting the fundraising loss information on how the money that some of the departments who received from the Re Relief Act Fund of 2021, how much money they have left and if they spent it. I'm still working on the details. This kind of came out last week and I, I need a little bit more of an explanation from MDEM as to what information they're looking for and how they're going to collect that information. Uh, so I will get with everyone that submitted and who received funding. I'll get with those departments individually. Our QR code has been created. If you would like one, please let us know. We have some extra. Um, they will be on all the president's vehicles, on my vehicle. Um, we will, uh, all of the executive committee members, if you want to keep them, you don't have to on your personal vehicles, but uh, if you'd like to have one for um, you to have, please let me know. We can always order more. Uh, Tag applications, uh, Executive Assistant Lynn Hawkins is now in charge of the tags through the office. So she works with Wayne and Frank on making sure that everybody gets their tags uh, in and submitted the right way with all of the correct information. Uh, I sent an email out to all the county coordinators last week um, stating please to get the uh, required signatures. That only protects your department from people who are trying to get tags that do not belong to your department or might not be a member of good standing. Um, so please make sure that those signatures are captured so we don't have to start sending applications back. Uh, at the desk this week, we, this weekend, we have a convention and conference seminar week at a glance, a uh, seminar at a glance. So if you'd like to know classes, there's only 55 classes being promoted this, uh, this convention and conference. So if you'd like to have this list, please let me know and I can get that to you. And if you'd also take, like to take a look at what the Maryland Recruitment and Retention Boot Camp for next weekend, what that schedule and agenda would look like, we also have that available. So please feel free to stop by the desk anytime this weekend, and I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Any questions for our executive director? Yes, sir, please. So, well, the money that for 2021, that's been dispersed and that's already been paid out. As far as 2022, we have not received any indication that they will make any further funding available. But because there's kind of talk of the budget, the governor's budget coming out and there being some sort of surplus, we're going to reach out to President Ferguson again and ask if there's any money for us. Any other questions? One comment from the chair. Uh, the weekly report. Uh, gentlemen, I hope everybody's taking advantage of getting that and then regurgitating it out to the different companies. Um, this past one that came out, the three-pager, fantastic. You had dates, you had times, you had information that's needed. Hopefully, everybody got a chance to see it before they came to Boldy's Computers um, to be enlightened and know ahead of time what's going on because we're back live and we're going to run with it. Thank you very much, Kate. Appreciate it. Secretary Doyle Cox for your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the report was uh, submitted electronically, but uh, as we uh, approach in the next uh, few months, few weeks, the uh, credentials that 
is uh, so vital to the association, is uh, starting to come in. Right now we've received somewhere in the neighborhood of about 196 uh, companies that have submitted their credentials. But my hat's off to uh, Dan Stevens, who has worked Southern Maryland, uh, with all of the companies down there, with the exception of two, I believe it is, has uh, submitted their credentials. So, St. Mary's County, you have two, uh, two companies. And uh, Dan, thank you. Uh, there's been uh, some other companies that has, uh, I'm sorry, other counties that have uh, stepped up and uh, submitted all of them. I know Frederick is uh, on the way. Uh, you know, Talbot County has uh, submitted uh, everything. So, yeah, for some reason this year it is much better than uh, in the past because uh, uh, everybody understands what we need. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have uh, two action items uh, today on the agenda for uh, minutes of being approved. December the 4th and 5th, uh, Executive Committee meeting in uh, Berlin, and January the 2nd, a special Zoom meeting. Uh, those minutes need to be approved. We have a uh, application for an associate member, Southern York County EMS Emergency Medical Service uh, of uh, On Road, Pennsylvania. Uh, they wish, it's a new organization. They wish to become a uh, member uh, of the association as an associate member. And uh, Mr. Brooks, he has anything to say on this? This is up in his area of uh, Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, this comes from the from the Chief Laura Taylor uh, of Southern York County EMS. Southern York County EMS was constructed a few years ago when uh, that part of the border with Maryland, uh, the volunteer fire companies divested themselves of, of ambulances and this organization was formed. And that basically included, for our purposes, uh, the Delta Carter Volunteer Fire Company and the Fog Grove Volunteer Fire Company, the front mutual aid back and forth into, into Maryland. Um, I am a part of this, full disclosure, I'm a part of Southern York EMS uh, and regularly attend their meetings. Uh, at their, their regular board meeting uh, this past week, uh, it was suggested that you know they, they, as they continue to grow and participate, and EMS, like it does everywhere else, has uh, expanded their run count and they're more and more going back and forth between Whiteford and, and Delta Cardiff and the, the other communities uh, that wanted to be a part of the Maryland State Firemen's Association. I gave them the overview on what that entails. Uh, and the next day we constructed the application with the mission statement and Doyle wanted money from them, so we got a check. And uh, we bring it for you today and, and certainly encourage a favorable response. Uh, that I could take back to that number. Mr. Chairman, this is um, this is something that's happened before. Uh, Blue Ridge Mountain runs a lot in Frederick County, and I don't know if they're still a member, but I know they've been an associate member for years ago. They were for many, many years. So there has been a precedent set to allow associate memberships for out-of-state companies that provide service from the state of Maryland. And I like to move we accept the uh, application. Mr. Chairman, Steve Cox, second the motion. The only question. We have a motion to accept. Give me the name again. Southern York EMS. Southern York EMS is an associate member of the Maryland State Firefighters Association. Any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose. Let the record show unanimous acceptance. And Thank the you. floor will now take a motion to approve the executive committee meeting in Berlin minutes and the Zoom conference call for the executive committee from January the 2nd. Mr. Chairman Charles Simpson, I move that we approve both the December 4th and 5th and the January 2nd minutes of the executive committee. Second by. And Ronald. 
I have a motion from Charlie Simpson, second by Ron Block, to accept the Executive Committee minutes from December 4 and 5, 2021, and the Zoom conference call Executive Committee meeting for January 2nd, 2022. Any questions? All in favor, aye. All opposed, no. Let the record show unanimous. Mr. Secretary, is there any further information? Yes, just one other uh, quick thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over the past uh, few months, we have started getting uh, our hearing of uh, companies celebrating their 25th, 50th, 100th, uh, so on uh, membership uh, with the association or their membership has incorporated our companies. So, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, as you go around and hear of these, let us know and encourage them to submit the information so we can properly uh, recognize them either here at the ocean or below. So again, uh, under the 50, 75, 100, and I think there have been the 200 grants now for some companies in the States. Uh, with that, uh, I have no further uh, yeah, report. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm sure we'll see you up here yes. momentarily. Chief Chaplain Reverend John Long for his report. Good morning. Uh, as of right now, we have Memorial Service will be recognizing 1090 duty deaths and we'll be presenting the uh, families with the flags and the resolutions at the Maryland Memorial. And that way we don't have to require to like, ask the families to come up with the Ocean City. We have four past presidents, three officers, and three committee chairs. Uh, there are a total of 442 tributes to recognize this year, plus another 14 just given to Baltimore County this morning. Uh, the prayer breakfast speaker this year is Wendy Norris, and I'm glad to see she's the keynote speaker. Wendy has a great presentation to make, so I hope to encourage everybody to attend the opening ceremony to listen to her speech. Uh, I've been working with Delegate Michael McKay from Western Maryland. He has submitted Bill HB 549, and that's to increase the Victim Compensation Fund for psychological treatment to $45,000. They'll make it the same as physical treatment for $45,000. Uh, a few years ago, I worked to try to get increased, but they only raised it to $10,000. And we have had a member who has benefited from this fund. So uh, that's why it needs to be raised to 45000 Contract has been signed with the Doubletree Hotel in Annapolis for the 2024 Federation of Fire Chaplains Conference. And there are two essentials classes coming. I want to tell you what happened to me a couple months ago. I was down in Loudoun County for the Teacher's Essentials class to 24 of their chaplains. Loudoun County um, uh, has taken the health, physical, psychological, and spiritual health seriously. They not only have a full-time clinician, they have a full-time psychologist, they have a dedicated building for the firefighter behavioral health. I mean, a dedicated building. This building has a full-size regulation gymnasium, full-size cardio, lab, full-size weightlifting lab, four classrooms, full-time chaplain's office, and the clinicians and psychologist offices are all in this building. I encourage, and I applaud uh, First Vice President Kurtz for his effort putting this committee together that I serve on, but it's going to take grassroots efforts from every jurisdiction to come on board. Uh, the MSFA needs to set a standard for every jurisdiction to follow, and I think if we look at the south of us, at Fairfax County and Loudoun County, we can follow the, their standards and make it a better fire service for everybody. The last seven weeks I've been taking a, a course for PTSD. It's an online course I'm doing. It's called a Reboot for the First Responders, and it's a 12-week course online or in person. And one nice thing about this is, I think this is a great, so far I've realized it's a great program in the first seven weeks going through this for PTSD. It's, uh, it's not in-person psychological care, but it's a good step for someone who 
hesitate, you know, I'll encourage people to do it after they finish it. I'm also looking to become a counselor for them. The Chaplain's Corps is here to serve you, and I encourage everyone to, if you don't have an active chaplain, please get an active chaplain. The chaplain's position is no longer an invocation benediction. Spiritual welfare is part of the triangle. Physical health, psychological health, and spiritual health. And I encourage everybody to take the chaplain's position seriously. If you take the chief's position seriously and make him get credential, it's time you can look at the chaplain's position and follow the suit. Thank you very much. John, just wanted to let you know that, of course, we have not only line of duty desk, but a couple of suicides in Frederick County, and they, our county um, executive and county council felt appropriate that they actually did some mid year budget trans, uh, transfer of monies and we will we made a job offer. Any questions for the Chief Chaplain? Thank you, sir. Ladies, I'll go to the MSFA officers, our pres Madam President. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to remind the people back in this corner that have the phones that keep chirping, I'm going to get $5 from them as soon as I figure out where the chirp is coming from. So um, please turn your phones off. Uh, I'd like to introduce my officers that are here with me today from the Bessie Marshall Committee, the co-chairs Kathy Niffle and Pat Demon. We have conference co-chair Teresa Christman. We have guard Samantha Butterfield, Vice Chaplain Kay Trago, Financial Secretary Joan Kramer, Second Vice President Jean Maine, First Vice President Melina Dahl. Um, I'd like to thank Teresa Christman for the birthday party she threw for Sparky in Annapolis yesterday. Lots of pictures on Facebook, very good for our uh, messaging. The Spring Conference is going to be March 26th at the Hollywood Firehouse. Um, all of you are welcome. I'll send out details via email this week. There's going to be an open house on Friday starting at 6 p.m. at the Hollywood Firehouse. Uh, our, my Bessie Marshall Committee co-chairs will give you their report. Um, but I will encourage everyone to sell those Bessie Marshall tickets so that we can help with paying the cases to the non light of duty injuries that our members are incurring. I'd also like, um, from a personal note, um, to thank Ann Stevens with his work with NIFRI and um, working with the College of Southern Maryland um, in order for them to uh, graduate with the fire, tech, fire science technology degree down there. There's three classes that are optional and they have to select one and none of them are offered in Southern Maryland. The closest one I believe is Howard County. So there's a whole contingent of students down there that are unable to get that final class for their degree because of that. So I'd like to uh, ask Dan to continue working on that. If those three classes cannot satisfy the degree, perhaps the College of Southern Maryland would consider an alternate for that. I'd like to also thank the Convention Committee for all the outstanding work that they have done. It is beginning anew again because it's been a couple of years and everybody's forgotten the notes that have become routine in the past. So that is my report. If anybody have any questions? What were those three classes? I have them listed. I can Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Representing the Bessie Marshall Fund, um, Kathy and Patricia, if you would, ladies. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Pat Demon, Bessie Marshall co-chair. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, Executive Committee members, officers, members, and guests. My part of the report was submitted electronically pertaining to cases. I would like to emphasize again, I please ask you to stress to the importance of following the rules and completing the applications correctly to all the members. I am still receiving several applications that are not correct from the first submission. 
Um, the incorrect applications not only delays payment, but also causes increased expenses such as postage to our committee. So please stress to your members the importance of reading the rules and looking over their applications before they place them in the middle today. Uh, I would like to say that today we have a raffle of the $25 Wawa gift card along with something for your sweet tooth, a large chocolate bunny. Um, they are a dollar piece for six o'clock. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Kathy Nipple and I'm in charge of the lottery and the money that comes in for our Rosie Marshall to um, pay for our cases. Since October 1st, we've received $5,084 in lottery sales. Memorial donations, $250. Individual donations, $300. Auxiliary donations, $2,825. And the fire department donations, of $150. We thank everyone for all the donations that we received. It enables us to pay for the cases. And I want to thank you for purchasing the lottery tickets and getting them out to your groups, your fire companies. And I have more on the table today if you need some more. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Thank you, ladies. Very informative. And once again, I want to remind you of the gentleman from the executive committee, coat and tie tomorrow, and the pin for five bucks. Your choice. Is fire prevention in the house? Okay, very well. Um, We'll go to MSFA reports. The Board of Trustees, Chairman Doug Alexander. And Mike Farlow, our attorney, you're on the deck. Good morning, everyone. Kind of nice to be back in person again. Uh, each of you on the executive committee have just received a written copy of my report. Why was my report not filed online? because we anticipated quite a bit happening this week and none of it did. So uh, I wanted to make sure you got a copy of it to have with you. Let's just skim through the report very quickly. We had our last uh, meeting, all five of us, back in January via Zoom. And uh, that meeting was basically to, to put together some sort of a plan at what we were gonna do and how we were gonna handle most of these COVID cases. Cause I mean to tell you, we were getting banged with these things. Um, we talked with our attorneys, we talked with the workers comp insurance people, Talk with our own MSFA uh, insurance people, Ron Block, Chip Jordan, Main Two, uh, and we reviewed the National Fallen Firefighter Statement. And bas basically, what we're going to do is go case by case on these uh, uh, COVID claims. And each case, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say the whole day, each case must be directly a result of a fire or rescue incident or an event involving training, fundraising, or maintenance, just as any other death case would be investigated. Okay? That's the important thing because we're just getting inundated with calls. Well, how about this? Or what about this? Or it's just kind of almost gotten to the point of ridiculous. I mean, the, uh, the five trustees have just been all over the state with phone calls and visits and everything else. Um, Tommy Mattingly down in Southern Maryland has done a bang up job of keeping up with some of the, he took on some of the assignments of, of gathering this information and did a terrific job of that. Terry Thompson was another one who went above and beyond and got quite a bit of this information for us so that we could make this particular decision. So uh, that's, that's where we are with that. The uh, COVID claims will be handled case by case basis. Uh, we've received one claim and four notifications of intent to file a claim since the last executive committee meeting. Uh, the claim received was denied as it was 308 days past the due date. Uh, the, uh, we had one notification that was never panned out, uh, no file, no, uh, uh, claim was ever filed, so that one's now moved away. We are currently expecting claim paperwork from four notifications in 2022, um, one of which is a COVID death case. Uh, we've, we've, we've spoken to these people, stayed in constant touch with them. Uh, we think it's going to be real interesting to see how this, uh, this turns out once we get the claim paperwork. We had an event uh, that we've never had before, and we're still really not quite sure what we're going to do with this in the future. We had a company who had a line of duty death, and on the surface it looks like a pretty legitimate case, and they wanted to get an autopsy to prove it, and were denied an autopsy. Now, why is that? That's because the state was backed up three weeks with autopsies. 
uh, I think they finally did uh, find a way and then courtesy of perhaps one of our local delegates or politicians were able to get the, uh, the autopsy. But this is, this is a, a bit of a problem because an autopsy in many cases that we deal with is, is the determining factor. I mean, it tells us for sure exactly what the cause of death was and how it was, how it was uh, attained. So we're, we're not really sure how we're going to go with this. I, ha I have attempted to get a hold of the uh, chief medical examiner, but I have not been successful as of yet. But we will continue to follow up on that to see if there's anything we can do from our end to assist them in making this available to us. So that's where we are with that. Sometimes that autopsy is, is a determining factor of whether or not it's a line of duty death. So that's, it becomes very important. Also helps us to determine whether maybe a tier one or tier two line of duty death. So the, the, the autopsy is just, just quite important. Um, we've been, as I said earlier, we've been bombarded with questions, requests, and submittals for deaths that do not fit the requirements of the state law relevant to the trustee benefits. We also, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on this, I think most people are. We also do not determine who goes on the Maryland Firefighters Memorial or who is recognized as an LODD at the Convention Memorial Service. And there is no connection between the trustee benefits and the public safety officer's benefits. There are two different benefits that involve two different sets of requirements and two different claim processes. And we've had a case where that guy may have gotten involved up this year. So I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that because I know when, when we get that case where somebody has passed away that we think is a line of duty, it puts stress on all of us. And, and sometimes maybe we don't go back to what we know. Keep in mind that anything for the trustees is on the website. You can go right to it, open it up, page through. Still don't understand the five guys you can call with more than help, more, more than uh, glad to help you. The trustees are very excited and encouraged about the additional funding in the governor's budget submitted to the legislature. To date, that funding has not been changed, and however, we do have until April 4th when the final budget approval has to take place. We took on some work early in the year this year, and in the governor's budget that was submitted uh, to the legislature and still stands tall, the trustees will receive 250,000 additional dollars in, in addition to the uh, 375 we are currently receiving. Now, what are we going to do with that money? We say, what are you going to for? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Number one, we already have dipped into our, our reserve funds over the past couple of years when we've run over. So we want to get that built back up so that we can keep that quarter million dollars set aside, particularly for a catastrophic incident or something along that nature. You know, we have a, a building collapse and kills three firefighters or something like that. That's a lot of money going out real quick. So we want to keep that, that reserve fund intact and we want to replenish that. We haven't raised our benefits at all in five years. It's time for raising benefits. So we, we plan to make some raises in benefits. We do not plan to raise the debt benefit. That benefit is pretty much capped at 11000 right now. And according to the information that we continue to receive, $11,000 is uh, co covers a moderate fee. So we, we, are gonna, we feel comfortable holding that right now where it is. So there's, there's the reasons that we, we asked for that money. Well, we didn't ask for all that. We asked for significantly less than that. But uh, I guess a good breakfast for the budget record paid off. So <laughs> I met with the budget record and over breakfast we discussed this whole thing. And, and uh, it paid off, I think. I'd like to thank uh, everybody, particularly a couple of the uh, executive committee members who have helped us with uh, the barrage of issues we've had with line of duty deaths over the past several months. Uh, and and uh, one thing I will, I will mention again, we're still waiting for the updated list of uh, appeals hearing personnel. Um, that, that's something we need to, to finish up on in the near future. Fortunately, we don't have anything that looks like it's going to get appealed at any time soon, so I don't think it's it's of the utmost importance, but we do need to get that uh, hammered out. And once again, the trustees get ready to assist with any claim submittal, and we will continue, just as we have over the past, particularly over the past six months, being flexible uh, in, in time allotments and so forth for uh, uh, LODD claims, LODI claims. It's, uh, it, it's been a real job. We've only had uh, one or two LODI claims uh, since last July, so, uh, and they were, they were all pretty simple. We had the, uh, last year the guys that got burned up in, in Northeast and uh, that went very smooth and I, and I have to compliment the uh, Charlestown Fire Company for the work they did on that. They they did an excellent job and it made our job easy. We had the first time since we've had the burn protocol in place in the protocol manual that we had burn subjects. And you'll see the percentage of burns 
created the amount of money they received. But we went through a roundabout process to try to decide how we were going to determine these percentage of burns. And it was going to it was going to cost us $1,502,000 to get a doctor to make this assessment and so forth. So we did it ourselves. We used the good old rule of nines and went up and talked to these guys and measured them up. And, and we negotiated a little bit. I mean, you can't be you know, hard fisted with this. And made sure that they were satisfied. We were satisfied. Uh, everybody got their checks. And we haven't heard a peep out of it. We, we did get a thank you from the, uh, the company, which we greatly appreciate. So that, that makes it uh, that makes it worthwhile when we can work with the folks and, and get the things worked out in an orderly fashion. I think that's about it. I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions or any comments anybody may have. Any questions or comments for uh, Mr. Alexander? Doug, I know it's been a, a tough job, but you guys are trudging through, and I understand all that, sir. And thank you very much. Our Appreciate respects, it. and thank you for your work. Our attorney, Mr. Mike Farlow. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just to let you all know, I've got to leave around lunchtime today. One of my fire companies has a big fundraiser tonight, so they want me to bartend. Um, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do you'll, it. You'll have a bunch of these guys want to go with you, so don't worry. <laughs> Down don't, at don't feel free to come by for a wild game night. So, following the uh, recommendation of the executive committee and special meeting to uh, forward a recommendation of a name change uh, to the convention. I have filed a trade name application with the state of Maryland so that we can offer ourselves some protection on the name of the Maryland State Firefighters Association uh, should that pass at the convention. I just wanted to make all of you aware of that. Um, also, I wanted to echo on what uh, Doug said a little bit about the autopsies. Uh, don't know how many people are aware of it. The chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland resigned a few weeks ago, leaving the office even more understaffed than they already were. Uh, there's a backlog of over 200, uh, last I counted, of over 200 people. So, in terms of getting autopsies for the trustees or for any other purposes, it is going to take a significant amount of time. Uh, give them some leeway possible in doing so if you need to get an autopsy because they are really, really backed up. I know that the governor has requested assistance from the federal government uh, in getting some, some medical examiners on a limited basis. So that's my report. If there's any questions. Any questions for our attorney, Mark? You have to go. You have to Google. Oh, okay. So they've taken care of it. Very good. Mark Belger, past president. It's my understanding that the Fed sent in doctors and the backlog has been completed. You are correct. The gentleman did resign, and they have not appointed or do it in. But again, my understanding from what I read, uh, the backlog has been brought up to date with the um, autopsies. Thank you, Mark. Mike, you can stay seated for a second. Uh, next up, uh, our parliamentarian report, Mr. Richard Brooks. And Mr. Ken Bush, yeah, there he is. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our parliamentarian in, in uh, workings with the attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, their work has been in inundated since the last uh, executive committee meeting. It's been exhaustive and we will let Mr. Brooks explain what he has done um, for the process that we are all eager to hear about. Uh, oh, that was a that. very nice introduction. Thank you so much. Members of the executive committee, it's a pleasure for us to be here. You know that at most meetings Pretty much every meeting that I'm over called upon for a report, we simply stand up and acknowledge that we are here, and we are here at the discretion of the chair. Uh, that's the way it belongs. If you look in the bylaws, we speak when we're spoken to. Uh, in this case, uh, the president has charged us uh, with uh, looking into the current situation of the potential change to the constitution and bylaws of the association. 
There have been several meetings. I have tried to leave the attorney alone because I believe that he does not belong in this, right? That he belongs in this as a complete, in a completely different way if and when it comes to that. This wonderful gentleman, Ken Bush, uh, who has been a parliamentarian for certainly a number of years, he and I have had tremendous conversations in how we're going to deal with this dynamic situation. And it's dynamic for at least another day or two uh, because we still have more than one proposed name of the association. That brought us into a discussion uh, and it was a, between friends, a knockdown drag out hour of how we were going to handle it and understand that it's the business of the association that we were arguing about. We're arguing towards the same goal to reach an end. And when I look at an end, it, to me, it's, it's allowing the delegates of the convention to be successful. That's the key, right? We want it to happen. We want it to happen in a proper way. Ken suggested that we call in the uh, Maryland Association of Parliamentarians, uh, which he did which is absolutely outstanding. And we agreed that we're gonna take their recommendations, they're the 24 hour professionals, uh, and take the recommendation. Um, we've had some discussions, we, we've met with the secretary, uh, we met with the, uh, the convention chair uh, and the president uh, and, and kind of dissected this thing down. The challenge here today is I would like us to stay in our lane for this discussion. There are various lanes that need to come up in this, right, that the secretary and the convention chair can join in. But our lane right now is to bring to you a potential resolution on how this will be voted on and the process that will take place. So with that being fair, you on, buddy. Thanks, Richard, I think. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as Richard alluded to, I did some research on the issue about uh, how to handle uh, the situation where uh, there are multiple proposals to a common amendment uh, to the documents of the association. Uh, I talked to a gentleman by the name of Mr. David Swift, uh, who is the uh, expert on parliamentarian procedures, and Robert Swift is a lawyer, and he directed me through this process. Uh, I had several conversations with Mr. Swift laying out all the possibilities and our particular problems specifically uh, to try to address the issue and to get his recommendations on the path of travel. Um, that being said, first off, I'd like to say that um, realize that there are two separate election processes that are listed in the, the MSFA Constitution. One would be for the election of officers. The other one would be for the change, to propose changes or amendments to the Constitution. So we're going to talk and I think the election of officers process is laid out pretty specifically in the Constitution. We did not have to address that. We didn't address that. So what we did do is try to specify the, the path of travel to amend the Constitution, which is the proposal on the table. Um, so that being said, I came up with a uh, proposed path as to how those procedures could, um, could proceed. Um, I, I think you all have a copy of that in advance. Um, that was given to you by the Secretary. A couple of uh, points I wanted to make, though, is that the bottom line is, in order to complete this process, you're directed to Article 12, or Subsection 12, of Robert Tools of Order, which is called uh, Creating and Filling Blanks, which means that we have to take each one of the proposed names uh, to create a blank, um, and then fill that blank, and then just then put up for a second vote as a constitutional change, uh, which is laid out in the existing wording of the Constitution. So that being said, um, what we first need to do is to narrow down um, the blank uh, that needs to be filled. Uh, there's a process there where those are all put on a ballot um, together, including the existing name of the association, which is posted there. Uh, and those are voted on, uh, the, the delegates will be uh, directed to vote either affirmative or negative on each choice. It's not to pick one, it's you have to vote yes or no for each choice. And that is by common practice and rule. 
And that being said, when you look at the number of votes cast for each choice, you have to make sure that you pick the ones that have a majority of those cast appropriate for those choices. Uh, if there are none of them which receive a 50% majority affirmative vote, which is possible, then the process is completed and you revert back to the existing name. It goes no further. If the, the choices come up where there's more than one of the, of the new choices which receives a 50% majority of the vote, you look at those and you take the higher percentage to fill the blank with that particular name. And then once again, uh, that's by Robert Ford of the War. So once that's done, that process is completed, and if the highest percentage vote is for one of the new names, that name is to fill the blank. The existing name gets the highest percentage of votes. The process, once again, is completed because that's the choice that's been made to keep the existing name. So assuming that one of the new choices is voted with the highest percentage, that then gets presented as a proposed change to the Constitution. There's a need for a second ballot as a constitutional change, and then that ballot has to receive a two-thirds majority vote in affirmative to change the Constitution. So that's the way the process works. If that receives a two-thirds majority vote, then that's the new name of the, of the association. If that fails to get two-thirds majority in affirmative, then it fails, and you're back to the existing name of the association. So as far as the process is concerned, and like I said, I went through all these different scenarios with Mr. Swift to figure out exactly how this is supposed to work. This was with his words of advice to us. Richard and I met on this, this topic, talked to, like Richard said, the secretary, the, the chair of the convention committee, and this is the process we all agreed to as the proper way to file. So, that being said, if anyone has any questions, we can certainly call the question. So the, the, the issue here is the care and feeding of the member companies. So when we go out to meetings, I'll start with the president. When, when they go out to meetings, when you go to your meetings, it's going to be carrying the message clearly because we've never done this before, right, in this fashion. We've never been put in this position before, which is fine, right? We have a workable solution. I say that because over the past month or since the, the last meeting, this has been construed a little bit, right, uh, in different opinions, right, on how it was going to go. Those opinions were, were being construed as we're trying to work through this, this process. And that happens. It's no big deal. What I'm saying is you now have that information. If you question the information or you need clarity on the information, then call and ask, right? And we'll be glad to, to regurgitate it and, and bring it forward. It's not a problem. Um, there you go. So cut to the, the, to the quick, and from my personal understanding as I represent 29 volunteer fire companies in Baltimore County, I will take this to them and explain the following. The proposed language for Article 1, Name and Membership, there are four items listed here. The company picks one as affirmative, but has to X out the nodes. No. And there, therein lies the care and feeding. Okay. Right? I'm going to say this, and I've said this once, and it's been thrown back in my face, but I'm going to, I rely on the intelligence of the delegates to do what's right. All right? And I believe that. They can check yes for all four. There's nothing here that says check one. That we, we have dialogued this out. They could check all four no and say, I'm not dealing with this, and check all four no. They're welcome to do that. The care and feeding of the delegates is, ladies and gentlemen, you need to pick the one that you prefer to be the name of the association moving forward from here. I didn't say pick one. You need to choose right, what that is. And they check yes or no for each one of those Question. Who's, who's next? We have the four in front of us. 
and we have a 90-day period for someone submitting. That, that opens a window, according to my count, that this is what we're going by as of this moment in time, but that could change if someone, if a member company came along after we start talking about this in the next day or so and submitted another change. And all that would do is just add the selection. That's correct. Okay. We're at 93 days. Correct. Yeah. When there's closure time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be in our best of interest if from the parliamentarian's office, Mr. Brooks or someone do a mini video, if we could get it out quickly on the web to explain and what you just discussed today or take the recording of today's meeting and post that so our message can get out clearer as well as we, it's our job to go out and do this also. Because I think you made some good points of different opinions now, but we've got, we've got the answers today. But I think it would be, an, I just think it would be an investment to our organization. I would say extract it from, the, from today's video. You just heard the best explanation yet. Yeah. Mr. Dayton, I think another thing that in listening and make sure I have this correct is this process takes place first. Then we have a second ballot, correct? If there's, there's enough votes to change the name, correct? If, if enough people select item B, C, or D, that would propose the second vote. If, if, if enough people want to leave it alone, then there is no second vote, correct? Correct. There's okay. there two scenarios where there's no second ballot. Number one is if the existing name gets the highest percentage of affirmative votes on the first ballot where they're all listed. Or number two, if none of the choices gets a 50% vote, which is possible, like Richard said, people could vote no on every one of them, and therefore you wouldn't get 50% of the vote on any of them. If either one of those cases occur, you revert back to your system and vote for a second ballot. One of, the, one of the questions that came up, and, and this is again, you know, required lengthy discussion on our part, is we believed prior to this resolution that there had to be a yes-no, right? Yes, no, I want to change, right? And that, you know, the, the, the parliament, the state parliamentarians suggest you're doing that with Maryland State Firemen's Association and one of the choices. There's your yes, no, right? Because people have to, my, my opinion at the beginning in Berlin, or after Berlin, the executive committee decided we were going to make a change, all right? Because we submitted, we, we have a task force, the task force reported, you accepted that recommendation, we're making a change, okay? Well, we can't. We, the, the membership, the delegates, right, of the member companies have to make that change, right? Yes, this is, this is a comprehensive way of doing it, but it's done so that everyone gets their fair vote uh, and gets to report it. But I come back to, we have got to lead the delegation through the path so that they understand the implications of what they're going to do when they get the ballot. You all know what I'm talking about, right? There are, there are delegates that are gonna go, yep, yes, boom, done. That's the last thing we need done. Or the opposite, no, all the way. And that's the last thing we need done as well. So we need to, from the podium, right, at, at a couple of points, Right in the in the day, you know, maybe it could go. You know, we'll, we'll talk further, but uh, maybe it can go with the safety message or when we have large volumes of people there of how this is going to happen, so that they understand completely. Look at the time we're taking here, right? Any further questions, uh, buddy?
so the we can chime in on this as well then. What I just said, the, the the change, yes or no, right, is fair to put on the ballot. The recommendation was that we include the Maryland State Firemen's Association as a yes or no. The president appointed a task force, the task force reported, this group accepted it and moved it forward as a change. We're making a change. Yeah, but in my in my conversation with Mr. Swift, that's part of the course of action you normally take. Is that the existing name is always listed on the ballot as a choice. So that's kind of a, um, a way that the Robert Shields are written as a handout. That's the secretary's side. And that, oh, the ballot, again, that's the secretary's side. We're, we're, I'm, we're, I really want to stay in our lane. Right? Richard also commended, it, but I think it's very important that we also make sure everyone knows that you sought advice of someone that doesn't have a dog in mind. And this is correct. a totally and completely unbiased organization, state parliamentarians, that go back to Robert's Rules of Orders to state how these various name changes occur in a corporate entity. So I think it's very important that everybody understands that this is a truly unbiased opinion that has no bearing on what the, they could care less. They're not firefighters, they're not EMS, they're nobody has anything to do with the fire service. And I think it's very important that we make sure that that message is out there also, that this is the way suggested through a parliamentary organization that is recognized statewide. And we are a statewide organization. So Absolutely. where should we go? So I think it's very critical that that message is out there too. And thank you all for your work. Through the brilliance of Ken Bush. <laughs> right? And, a, and about an hour long telephone call. That's how, that's how we saw it the Mr. Chairman, just just a suggestion that uh, this uh, document that we have uh, be sent to, uh, I think the, the secretary has an email address for the president of the fire company and the chairman of the uh, delegation. So they, that's what was required. And a copy of this be sent to each of those people for every company so that, uh, you know, at least they'll, they'll have the right questions to ask. Just a suggestion. Okay, like, like Richard sta said, he's staying his lane. We will address that with the secretary as for notification purposes. Am I correct? There's one more point to add. I think that you might need to wait until the end of that 90 day window closes to make sure that this is complete. We're going to send it this way. Um, and it, that'll give us plenty of time before the actual election because that doesn't occur until June. So we can wait to do that. We can make copy of this available with the voting process where the ballots are distributed. So if anyone has any questions or last minute or hasn't seen it for some reason, they certainly would have a chance to look at it before they cast a vote at the end. The other thing I wanted to point out is I tried to keep this to one page so nobody says that they have to turn a page or turn it over look for a second sheet where there's another direction they might not be able to find. So I think that's important things to find. Also known as the KISS method. Keep it simple. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Ken, you may have said this. If in the first process, in the voting for the ABCD names, no one gets 50%, is that what you're saying? 50%? Yes. If none of them get a 50%, then there is no second. That's correct. Okay. And then you go back to the use of it. Just, just so I'm kind of, correct. the questions are going to come up. Oh, yeah. And that's why I tried to address them with Mr. Swift from the beginning. Any of the possibilities I could think of, I went through and he gave the answers each one. All right. Any other questions from the chair? Very good. What do you want to do? Question two. Ah. Absolutely. Is this in regards to the name thing? Okay. Why in the, in the uh, last page of it where you have the four options, why don't you identify it as uh, no change to, put, put on there, no change and I mean, the name change or some kind of where it would be? so that they clearly understand that what they're voting on, that they're voting not to change the name of the associate.
Association. That's A. Yeah. Okay. Why wouldn't you put on there something to identify that you're voting no change to the name? I'm just asking. I would have no objection to that if you want. If you're saying parens no change. Yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, just a question. Well, my. So just for dialogue purposes, and you know, I won't tend to weigh in on this, but um, just for dialogue purposes, I come back to, I have to rely on the integrity of the delegate. How far am I going to confuse the delegate, right? And that is, they're going to choose a name of the Maryland State Firemen's Association. It may be the name that we have that they're going to endorse. It may be a name change. I just think it's going to be a complicated item on the... We agree. We agree. And, and that, I guess the other question I have, uh, has there been any dialogue with the old glory to find out how it puts the uh, No, not nothing. Mr. Chair, if I could address that, the only way, the reason it was listed the way it was is because that was the advice given to me by Mr. Smith. He's been doing that way. Because I asked about whether we need to indicate it was a change, he said that was not necessary to list the name as it stated. It's up to the delegation to make that change. It's up for them to recognize. To recognize. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Next item. Question two. So quest question two, if you look on your paper, um, if the name of the association is going to be the Maryland State Firemen's Association, uh, at the bottom under Article One, Name and Membership, Section One, it is an addition of a sentence for clarity for the world to see. Whenever the term fireman is used in this document, that term shall not be meant, meant to be gender specific. I need that wording for it. it shall, that term shall not, is not meant to be gender specific. Does everybody follow the logic, All right? All right, let me explain it just to make sure. The logic is this association is under concern uh, from several of our elected officials uh, that we have not joined the year 2022 uh, and we are not inclusive of all of our members, hence the proposals that you have before you. We know, we know there is a lot of emotion to this across the state, but in the case in the case that the membership chooses option A and the name of the association remains the Maryland State Firemen's Association, it is appropriate then that we clarify the emotions of the association <clears throat> at the end of Article 1, Section 1 with that inclusion, whatever the term fireman is used, is used in this document, that term is not meant to be gender specific. I see heads bobbing, and I like that. Uh, so I turn turn back to you for questions. Question on that: Wouldn't that apply with any of the options that we should put that in? That regardless what the name is, that it's not gender specific. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt. Sure, it doesn't hurt. And it's meant to be inclusive. So any name you pick, this could be relevant. So that's why I was written that Any other questions? Gentlemen, any other comments? Not now. Wait till June 17th. Thank you folks for your work. A lot of headaches. For real. As the parliamentarians are leaving, because I don't want to include them in this comment, they need to remain somewhat neutral. I, I do want to remind the executive committee that you do have, although seldom used, you do have the bully pulpit, uh, as do the presidents, uh, and the, the executive committee has made recommendations, so you can make that clear to the county associations as you go to visit them. I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Uh, at this time, um, prior to breaking for lunch,
uh, I will be calling an executive session of the executive committee at the beach house, the yellow building next to the fire station. Uh, I would highly recommend you grab something to eat and then we'll head that way. So an executive session uh, at the end of this. Oh, okay, very good. Uh, at this time, the chair requests the uh, three candidates who are running for the office of second vice president to come forth and take five minutes each to speak to the membership. So Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Carey, and Mr. Smith, make your way forward to the front table, please. Gentlemen, you have stated and have uh, entered into uh, the race. Um, we can go by flip of a coin or whoever wants to go first. Go first. There you go. By choice. <laughs> uh, most of you know me. I'm Skip Carey. In Berlin, I decided that prior to Berlin, I decided that I would seek to be the second vice president after a fair number of years working within the association and being retired and having the time to vote to it as to when I really wanted to do it back when I was young family and working for a living. There are, I think each one of us here has the same three objects that we feel are important for the association. Very simply, and we all know the first one to do, uh, what, that's it, uh, retention, recruitment and retention. We have to get people in, and more importantly, we have to keep them in. And it's an equal balance. You cannot have all young, inexperienced people or all experienced people. You have to balance it out because the experience has to put their arm around the shoulder of the inexperience and say, hey, you know, this is why we do this. This is how we do this. This is what we do this for. And that's pretty important. And keep the retention involved there is, uh, is equally critical. The second thing, and, and we've just seen where uh, Vice President uh, Ben has uh, already formed a committee for that. We've been pretty good over the years of looking out for physical injury. But we sort of let the mental aspect of injuries go by the wayside. We've had the, uh, oh, I'm the big, strong firefighter. You know, nothing bothers me. The problem is it is bothering us. We may not admit it but we're seeing our members take their own life. Nothing can be worse than having one of your members be so disturbed, be so upset over something, that they can't go to you and talk, or they don't have anybody to go to you and talk, and they take their own life. You know, far worse than a line of duty death. Far worse. But not only us, the military is finding it very much now, too. So it is a current... Uh, problem that exists, and, and we're working towards that with the, the committee that's been set up with uh, uh, the safety committee's got a couple of things coming up, too. And the third thing, which I happen to think is for training, we have to make sure that the training is still germane to the problems that our people encounter, but we also have to realize of the pull and the pull on the individuals with the training and make it so that it's somewhat um, more palatable for the individual to go out and get the training. To that end, I choose, chose to say, okay, hey, fine, I'll do this. I'll run. And I, I look forward to, if I'm going to be successful working with Ben and Eric, uh, to keep uh, the incentives and things of the past administrations and the current administration have worked with and are keeping going. I didn't join I didn't join this race to reinvent any wheels. You know, what I joined it for was to make sure that the wheels that have been thought about and put into service in the previous years are still turning and are still rolling forward and not rolling in the reverse. So basically that's me. 
handed out the folder today. You can, can see why I think the qualifications and the fact that I've spent a fair portion of my life involved in the fire service. Uh, I got a little bit of a, a love for it. It's not a job, it's a way of life. That Thank you, it? sir. <coughs> Who's next? Todd? I'll go next. We'll just go right down the line. Okay, bud. <laughs> Hi, my name's Todd Smith. I come from Washington County. Uh, I started off at the age of 16 as a volunteer in Boonesboro. Uh, progressed up through the ranks, both operation-wise and administrative-wise. Uh, I've held everything from a sergeant to a deputy chief uh, to a treasurer. I served as second vice president for Washington County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. I've served on the standards committee for Washington County for several years. Uh, volunteer firefighter, EMT, CRT, paramedic. Road seats on engine, truck, rescue squad, been the lead paramedic. Uh, worked for Baltimore County Fire Department for 32 years. And when I came to Abbey Academy, I went to Station 7 in Essex. So this is looking right like being home right around the corner from where I got my career time started. Um, Subbed as an EMS lieutenant for uh, Really lots of calls, talked to a lot of people. Been across this state back and forth talking to everybody. Uh, like Skip had said, you know, I think we're all on the same slate of what we're, where our platforms are based on. Recruitment and retention is essential to forward progression and development of any organization. If we can't recruit, if we can't recruit our people in and then keep them and have them move forward to move forward the organization, we're not helping. Uh, accomplishing anything. Uh, we just stagnate. And I think what we're looking at is we see a mix of people. We come from different areas. We come from different backgrounds. We pull all that together and we keep it in the forward and momentum like we have over the years. Pride and integrity in this organization is, is what this has been based on for years. Uh, generations upon generations of people throughout the fire service. Their fathers did it, their grandfathers did it, their great grandparents did it. There's generations of people within organizations across this state that have multiple generations of members. And they build them that and they teach them that. If you look at those organizations, they taught them as they came up through from one generation to the next. And that that with the that's what we need to continue to do as we do that. We need to keep moving forward and teaching the young people as they come in. We need to take them and go, this is where we are, this is where we want to be, how do we get there, let's all work together and let's move it in that position. Um, Health-wise, we've done great strides in health for providers, uh, cancer awareness, cardiac, but we're seeing an explosion in the mental health problems with the increase in suicide rates that over the past 46 years that I've been involved in the fire rescue service, we've never ever seen it explode at such a rate that it has at this point. And why is that? What's caused that? Uh, we see a lot of programs on TV now, a lot of made for TV programs, and it paints a picture that we're heroes. We go out and we save everybody. Nobody died. The reality? We don't save everybody. People die. Are we setting up our people for failure at that? By not going in the very beginning when they start and go, look, you're going to see things that you never, ever thought you would see in your life. You're going to see things that most people never see. There are people out there that we can't save and there's nothing we're going to be able to do about it. You have to be able to let that go and talk with your people in your departments or get help for that and it's okay to not be okay. That's a big thing. You have to realize that sometimes you're not okay with it and you have to talk to people about it and you have to do something about it and that's okay. You know, years ago, like Skip said, we're big tough firemen. You know, nothing bothers us so sometimes you have to just have to go and go, you know, that call really bothered me this situation is really bad and, and I don't, I can't handle it, I need to talk to somebody about it. 
we need to move forward with that just like we have with the heart problems, um, the cancer, and the mental health issues. That's what we need to do. Um, the, the whole vision of this organization is to move us forward, to keep us going, uh, to be progressive with it, and to take everybody along and not leave anybody behind in the process, whether it's the training, whether it's mental health, whether it's with the cancer or the heart problems. You know, years ago, we never thought about, oh, you're gonna, like, wash your hoods. Now the apartments are like, every Monday, you're gonna take your hood, you're gonna wash it, you're gonna take your spare one out and use it. Every Monday that happens, you know. You come back, you clean your gear. It used to be a big pride thing of how dirty your gear got and how burnt up you got your helmet. And I see everybody like sort of nodding and smiling and going, yep, we remember those years. Now it's, hey, that could cause cancer. That can cause you problems down the road. Look, we need to do this and we need to stay on it. And we've seen that that trend. We've turned the corner and we're seeing that happening now. Uh, the same thing can happen through the fire rescue service for all of us on everything that we do from now on and as we teach our younger people coming in where to go and how to get the help and how to do things. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, and I would respectfully request that the uh, chatter in the room be kept to a minimum, be fair to everybody here. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Simpkins, officers, committee chairs, members of the MSFA and LA MSFA. I thank you for the opportunity to again speak before you. Uh, as I begin, uh, I would like to ex start, extend my heartfelt condolences to past President Danny Davis, who provided strong leadership for many years. Danny served Southern Maryland, the Southern Maryland counties as well as the MSFA with distinction and honor. He will be sorely missed, so I ask that you please continue to keep Rose and the family in your thoughts and prayers. As many of you know, my name is Paul Sullivan, and I'm from here in Baltimore County, literally five minutes up the street. Uh, and I'm proud to announce that I am a candidate for the Office of Second Vice President of the MSFA. I've been in the fire service 36 years, and serving as the Chief Officer of Paramedic and Emergency Services Instructor, and continue to do so today. Um, again, for the first time, we have, in a, in a, in a good while, maybe a decade, we have three candidates. Um, it's going to be healthy. It's going to be interesting. So what I tell you before I move on is please register and please vote. Um, regardless of who you vote for, exercise your right for your voice to be heard. Again, I am running because I believe my experience in education, my positive leadership, integrity, and my high standards along with my passion for this system will allow me to continue to move this organization forward. Since announcing in December, uh, I've traveled the state, east, east, west, north, south, central Maryland, I've been all over the place, um, attending county association meetings. And I do want to say that I appreciate the reception and hospitality that I've received at East Walmart. Listening to the issues that each county has uh, has become important to me. Many of them I did not know existed. Um, very interesting as I, I travel the state. As many of you already know, I've had the opportunity to serve on a, a number of MSFA committees and continue to do so today. Uh, some which include the Safety Committee, the EMS Committee, uh, and the Grants Committee, and uh, newly appointed to the first Vice President Ben Kurtz's Mental Health Task Force, which I'm glad to be part of that task force. As many have set up here, that is a primary uh, priority for me as our individual mental health. Uh, I say this uh, a lot of having experienced this, but it's nothing like talking to somebody on a Thursday and Everything appears to be copacetic, and on Saturday morning you get an email that such and such took their life. And when you talk to them on Thursday, you recognize nothing that was wrong. And that ability for them to take their life a day and a half later didn't happen overnight. We failed. We really failed. So I'm hoping with the task force we're going to be successful in being able to provide some training on being able to recognize some of the signs and symptoms so that we as leadership uh, boots on the ground leadership can, can maybe help curtail some of that, but more importantly, have a clearinghouse of resources to be able to provide for those individuals. I believe that active and daily operational experience by MSFA leadership is going to be and continues to be critical in recruiting our younger members to MSFA. 
So I think you really need to be engaged, you need to be involved, and you need to know the issues of today. As discussed at the executive committee meeting in December, I announced my candidacy not only because of my passion for our fire rescue and EMS system, but also because I want to have the opportunity to help grow and improve the MSFA. In the event I'm elected as your second vice president, there are a number of initiatives I'd like to work on, as we've all discussed, personnel, mental health, and wellness being a priority. Recruitment and retention, again, I say this as I go around the state, we continue to fight for the same resources, whether it's the Little League, whether it's the Boy Scouts, whether it's the American Way, whether it's the Red Cross, we're fighting the same group of individuals for volunteers. So we have to do something to en entertain or engage those individuals who want to come here and participate with us. Uh, more so, we get those individuals in the door pretty quickly, but we don't keep them. The recruitment's one effort, retention's another. I think they need to be separated to be understood the importance of both. Professional development is pretty important to me. I think that the MSFA needs to provide resources to our member organizations, more specifically our administrative officers, for those individuals that step in the roles who don't know how to do those roles. I give another example as President of the Royal Fire Chiefs Association getting a phone call from a member company. And the individual says, Hey, Paul, how are you? Great, I'm doing good. How are you? Well, I just stepped into the role of president for my organization, and in my mind, I'm like, why? But, without judging me, I have to do a budget, and I have to provide my board a budget on Monday night, and I don't know how to do a budget. Can you come help? And we're going to come help, because that's what we do to make sure people don't fail, and they're successful. But we have individuals that step into positions for the various reasons of maybe nobody else wanted to do it, and they elected to step up to try to help. Maybe they were the popularity vote because the last guy who held them accountable, we can't have that, we bring the next guy in. But not always do they have the education. So I think we need to do better to try to give them that education. And finally, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I believe that we truly need to treat everybody fairly and give everybody equal opportunity to be a part uh, of this organization and their organizations. In the event you're not familiar with me, please take a minute to visit my website. It's holdenformsfa.com. I do have some propaganda that's out there, uh, as my other competitors have put out. Um, you know, take a minute to learn about me and my initiatives. I then urge you to carefully review the qualifications of the three candidates. Decide which one will be best for the future of the MSFA. Decide which one will be best for the future of the MSFA. I am sure that you will come to the conclusion I am the best qualified candidate for the position. Today I'm asking for your support and endorsement and vote for my candidacy to the office of second vice president for the MSFA in Ocean City in June. We're having an election. Get out and vote. As I close, I would like to thank the many individuals, departments, associations, and past presidents who have already endorsed me. And more importantly, I'd like to thank the following members from my election committee who are present with me today. MSFA Executive Committee Doug Simpkins, MSFA Past President Paul Sterling, and LA MSFA past president, Teresa Crispin. If anybody has any questions for me, I will be here today and tomorrow, and I will definitely be willing to entertain any discussion. Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Very informative, and we appreciate, like you say, it's been a long time since I've seen three candidates. Um, so we're, we're really excited for this. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Chaplain John Long, if you make your way to uh, a microphone, prayer for lunch folks it is two minutes to 12 uh, we will uh, break for lunch and we're looking for an hour uh, I would respectfully request that you would allow the executive committee members to get their lunch so we can get over for our executive session a working lunch Sandy wants to pull a 50-50 Sandy wants to pull a 50-50 well then look, Sandy gets to pull the 50-50 Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank everyone for their donation. You would win $198. Winning ticket is 438-030. 438-030. You're only 30 off. T's only 30 off. We have a winner in the back? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. 
<laughs> Reverend Long, Please your prayer for prayer. lunch. Ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for being with us this morning. We ask you to continue to be with us. Father, as we break bread with each other, we ask you to bless this food and all those who have prepared it. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. One o'clock, approximately, restart. Thank you. Call the uh, second session to order. We will have, first of all, we want to give something away. So the, uh, the uh, Bessie Marshall ladies will have a, a drawing here. Chip, pick a number. The winning number, 2080940094, last three numbers. What's the color of that ticket? Pur uh, purple water, yeah. purple ticket, I guess. Purple ticket, Violet, water. 094. 094, last Doyle number. Cox is the winner. Okay, Teresa, you want to start off? Um, I'm going to deflect to the fire marshal. Very well. Brian? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Tockerman on my right. He is the uh, chairman of the uh, State Fire Prevention Commission, and I will allow him to uh, give his remarks and comments first. Very well. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Fire Marshal Garassi, and uh, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I especially want to thank uh, President. All right, stand by, stand by. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you. Ed. Um, I especially want to thank President McCray for extending an invitation for me to come today. And uh, it's an honor for me personally, not only to be a commissioner, but to be the chairman of the commission. And as uh, my commissioners know, I take fire prevention seriously. Um, in fact, the state of Maryland, as far as the commission is concerned, as far as the state fire marshal is concerned, is in a totally leadership position. We're first in the nation, and there are 49 other states and, and commonwealths that are behind us. The state of Maryland at the present time uses the NFPA 1 and 101 Life Safety Code with appropriate amendments as the State Fire Code, <clears throat> the 2018 edition. We're in the process of updating that to the 2021 edition of NFPA 1 and 101. <clears throat> We'll come back to that in just a second. <coughs> Several years ago, the commission voted that every unsprinklered residential high-rise building in the state of Maryland was an inimical hazard. In doing so, that put the commission in a position of responsibility that we would be able to correct the fire prevention hazards in such buildings <clears throat> retroactively. The 2021 edition that's under consideration, it is currently in the what is known as AELR. Um, when that's adopted, it'll come back to a, the commission. We will vote on it again after a public hearing, <coughs> and then will we as far as I'm concerned, it will become state law. That 2021 edition 
sets a deadline of January the 1st, 2033 for all residential high-rise sprinkler buildings to be sprinklered. That is going to be a tremendous asset to the fire service, to the citizens of the state of Maryland. Already, um, because the legislature and the governor has given Fire Marshal Grassi the authority over sprinklers in single-family dwellings, we're seeing hundreds of single-family homes completely sprinklered. In Baltimore County alone, that number is hovering around 4,000 single-family homes. <coughs> The commission has done a wonderful work. We have at the present time where the colonel of the state police, Woodrow Jones, has supported the commission, as far as I know, greater than any other state police superintendent. And so, well, I publicly thank uh, Colonel Jones. He knows that the commission supports him and we recognize his commitment to fire safety, fire prevention, and to the commission as the experts. So, and with that, I'm willing to take any questions that anyone might have. And it's good to see some of my fellow commissioners here Commissioner Alexander, Commissioner Bilger, Commissioner Stevens, and Commissioner Faust. So, any questions? Hearing none, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, State Fire Marshal Brian. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Brian Duracy, Maryland State Fire Marshal. Uh, just to bring you up to date on a few things. So far, we're three months in, uh, we have already have 18 fire fatalities on the books. Clearly, uh, again, I will preach the, the message. We need to do more. Now that we're winding down from COVID and the weather's getting nice, ladies and gentlemen, we gotta get back out in the communities. We gotta knock on these doors and talk to people. And we gotta take every advantage we can in the community settings uh, to get out there and, and spread that message with regards to smoke alarms, exit plans, closing those doors at night. Um, really important. Um, we continue to see homes where we're losing loss. Loss of life that doesn't have smoke alarms in it. And here we're in 2022. I mean, come on. I mean, uh, we got to get that message out there. So please ask your departments to do that for us and uh, continue to get those messages out there and engage the public. That's really the help most helpful thing. And I'm sure Teresa will expand on it too and tell you that in the community risk reduction world, that one on one contact is, is extremely important. Uh, you know, piece of paper stuck in the door. Somebody might read it, somebody may not, but if you're talking to somebody and talking to them about it, um, they get that message. So um, so we're up to 18. Uh, we've only had one residential multiple fatality fire this year, thank God. Uh, last year, we're at 60 right now. Uh, as you heard earlier, with the ME's office uh, on the backlog, we still have uh, five deaths still pending with the ME's office for last year. Um, so. Uh, now, out of that 60 right now, we lost nine children. We lost 17 seniors. Um, the seniors have come down a little bit. The kids went up. Uh, but that's our most vulnerable populations, as you well know. So uh, those are the folks we need to continue to work on and, and help those folks. Um, I will give kudos to FABSCOM, uh, the Fire and Burn Injury Coalition of Maryland. Uh, they're doing tremendous work getting out there installing hard of hearing smoke alarms for residences throughout the state. Um, we've partnered uh, with a new company on that, with bed shakers and those types of things. Um, so those detectors are getting out there and, uh, and they're doing great work on that. Um, just a little information on personnel in the office. Uh, we've had a few people brought on board, uh, contractual inspector in Northeast. And uh, finally, after many years, uh, we've uh, hired a fire protection engineer who's gone to our Southern Region office, and that Southern Region engineer is now at headquarters. So uh, after two, probably two and a half, almost three years, we have an engineer back at headquarters. We still have a vacancy out west. 
uh, for an engineer as well. So we, uh, we think we have somebody on the hook <laughs> from the University of Maryland yeah. that we're bringing in as an intern. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, set that hook and uh, he'll come work for us once he graduates in the next year or so. So, uh, so we're working on that. Um, we, uh, you must know, uh, you know, the chief deputy, uh, Greg Durr left to become the Howard County Police Chief. Uh, we interviewed for his position this week. Uh, there were several, seven applicants. So we're going through those now and going through that process. Um, the Deputy State Fire Marshal, uh, we've opened that back up as well. Uh, we need to hire a few folks for that. And orientations are in April. And I'll uh, thank Kate for getting that out, that information out to the association. Thank you, Kate. For that, I appreciate that very much and they get that message out there uh, to get some folks. I think we have right now close to 70 people that have already signed up for the orientation, so that's a good thing. Um, just to let you know, we have a, now a, a certified, qualified facility comfort dog uh, with the Office of the State Fire Marshal. So going to the mental health piece then, uh, we have that in place. If you need that dog, all you gotta do is call us. If you have a serious incident, uh, did you think that, uh, that Sandy would be able to help you with? I know we've had a couple of incidents already. Uh, we've been out to Frederick County in a few cases, uh, even gone to the communication center um, where they had that serious incident where that father and son incident out there that murder suicide. So I know there was a tremendous help for them. Uh, but that dog's there for you to use, uh, for us to use. So uh, if you need it, please don't hesitate to call and, and have Sandy come out. Sandy's obviously named after Deputy Chief State Fire Marshal Sander Cohen, who was killed in the line of duty. Uh, so the numbers for us for last year, 827 incidents, 630 of those were fire-related, 121 explosive-related, and 70 other investigations. Uh, we closed 65 criminal cases by arrest, locked up uh, 86 individuals, uh, 38 incendiary cases closed by arrest, which resulted in a 33% closure rate which is well above the national average of 18 to 20 percent. Uh, I will tell you there was a 9 percent decrease in the number of incendiary incidents across the state in 2021, so that was good to bring that number down. A little over 10,000 inspections and close to 1,900 plans reviewed. Um, just this uh, month, here in March, early March, you all saw the explosion in Silver Spring with the fire. They called out our major incident response team. Our folks responded on Friday to assist uh, Montgomery County with the origin and cause investigation and do witness interviews and those types of things. So uh, the team hasn't been called out in quite some time because we haven't had anything big. And, um, okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, so that was it on that. That was, uh, you know, the result of human error. Uh, the maintenance man cut the natural gas line in the basement thinking it was a water line, and obviously there was a flash fire and an explosion in the building. Uh, unfortunately, uh, no one was killed. They had 14 people injured. Uh, there's still one person in the hospital who's critical condition, and he is still, uh, he's gonna survive, but uh, he's, uh, he was severely burned, so. Uh, the chairman just asked me to mention to you that uh, we had a significant uh, salary increase we got uh, for the fire protection engineers. Uh, so that has helped us in, uh, in getting these folks on board. If I can, just for a minute, I just want to run through the list real quick on reports, incident reports that we are lacking from last year uh, from the certain departments. Um, clearly, this, you know, the reports are tied to money. You got to tell these departments. You want your 508 money, you got to get the reports into us. Um, so no ticket, no laundry, okay? Um, so I'm going to just run through them real quick. Newburgh, Herlock, Vienna, Hartford County EMS, Rock Hall, Churchill, Sundersville, Ridge, Bay District, Robbie, Parsonsburg, Powellville, Westside, Ocean City, and Arundel County, Annapolis City, and Howard County. All OS reports for last year, 2021. Here we are, March 2022. So uh, if you want your 508 money, folks, you gotta get those reports in. So, appreciate the time today, Mr. Chairman, as always. Thank you so much for letting us go ahead and uh, letting the Chairman speak today. I appreciate that very much. Very well, thank you, Brian. And on a personal note, um, uh, 
with the tragedy in Baltimore City, it was very comforting to see a familiar face talking to the media and I explaining what was going on. So thank you for what you did. Uh, I know the families personally of two of them, and they, they needed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chief Phelps? Yes, ma'am. For the uh, sprinkler trailer, I've just got a short report here. I had filed it, but I didn't see it on the uh, list. Um, as anybody can guess, there hasn't been a whole lot going on with the sprinkler trailer since the last executive meeting as far as use. Uh, Talbot County is still in the process of planning the demolition of the building we're storing our trailers in, but we've not had an update as to timing when we'll have to have them out. Uh, the one trailer that we wanted to loan to Delaware, I can tell you that I have sent a draft of a loan agreement to Delaware for approval, and I'm awaiting a response from them on that at this time. Basic agreement after our conversation at the last meeting requires that the trailer be housed inside when not in use, is insured when not in travel or use, be kept in the name of the MSFA and the motor vehicle tag will remain on it, and to be returned to the MSFA at the end of its use in the same condition it was received. A note on that would be the trailer is ready to use. We could pull it outside right now and um, do a, a demonstration with it. It's all ready to go. I'm being noted. The other thing I've got to say here is um, our goal at this time is to have the transfer complete uh, by the 1st of May. We've uh, made arrangements with the Delmarva Volunteer Firemen's Association to present the trailer to Delaware at their convention, which will be in Hartley, Delaware, uh, May the 7th. And we're hoping to get the media there. We'll have some uh, media coverage, both for the state of Delaware and their sprinkler initiatives, and also for the MSFA and their contribution to those efforts. I think it, come, it could come out to be a pretty good thing. I've uh, been speaking with the president about it. We've been dealing with the uh, Delmarva Association uh, president and also with members of their legislature who are very much in, in favor of this happening. And I believe that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Very good. Ladies. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Cindy Wright Johnson. I am the chair for the Risquatch subcommittee. I did submit a written report. I'm just gonna highlight a few things for you. Um, thank you again for the ongoing support. We are inventory ready for convention. We've got a few more things we need to do and the biggest of that is going to be recruiting people. We have adult leaders for all of the risk areas and um, one more confirmation, we, we think we're gonna be in the same place upstairs on the second floor. We will do steps to safety and uh, encourage families to come. I worked closely with both Kate and Lynn and we will be using most of what is in the storage unit we ordered for 2020 and carefully boxed in Tupperware and saved. So all of those things, I have personally opened all those boxes, everything is still good. The kids will get backpacks, our volunteers will have t-shirts. I've got a list for you of um, what we plan to highlight. We are going back to pedestrian safety with the American Trauma Society and Title Health Peninsula Trauma. Many of the other stations will be the same and our new station will be a um, much more developed version of what you saw at the December meeting, but it will focus on safe sleep. Um, as I've said before, the leading cause of death in children under the age of two in this state is unsafe sleeping circumstances. And so we will have that display and we will also be doing a presentation on that. Um, huge thanks to Lynn and Kate for both the work on planning our four educational programs as well as helping us figure out where everything is and gearing back up for the next um, convention. We do have ongoing grants with both child passenger safety and bike safety that are funded by the Highway Safety Office. Um, I've listed a number of other resources that are there and I think the highlight Okay, the highlight is the upcoming seminar um, that will be in person, but also thanks to Chris, will also be available virtually on April 2nd. So our guest speaker for um, that day is Lenny Carmichael, Chief Lenny Carmichael from the Trenton, New Jersey Fire Department. 
He is a national speaker on um, pretty much chief related, like officer related um, programs, but he's going to take his chief officers program and take it to the community risk reduction level and try to help us, the educators, help our communities with helping the fire service understand why we do what we do. And in a way, since I asked Lenny to take your program of scene size up and like just the different buildings so that when we as an educator can go to that building and say, this is what your building is made of. This is how we have it. A lot of people will say, well, why does the fire department take so long to get there? Why is there so many people sitting in front yard? Why is this person just doing this? Why is that person standing there? Well, as an educator, you're trying to help ed educate your community the best you possibly can. And by doing that with his concept, it was a great program. Um, he's going to try to help us there for our level. With Ken Bush speaking, fire marshal. And then uh, we have something a little bit interactive this time. We have um, Bree. Um, she is a fire department member in North Carolina, but she is also a school teacher. And during COVID, we were following along with her because she was creating, um, because the schools were going to Google Slides and all these different like programs online learning, she created a fire department community risk reduction program. So it's an interactive station. She's gonna be teaching from North Carolina. So we wanted to show people that you can do these things in, a, in any type of format possible. She did tape her program at the North Carolina Summit uh, about four weeks ago, I think. And um, we are gonna show that, and then we're gonna be able to do interactive skills with her. So we, we look forward to that aspect. Um, we can't thank Cindy enough because money from her, um, what was it, EMSD for Children Fund, that what brings our lunch, we would like to thank you. Networking to, resources yeah. for the record. Yeah. Um, we'd like to thank Mifri for giving us the ability to use the home. I can't have 100 people in there this time. I'm only allowed 50 for the University of Maryland. But um, move it up. <laughs> um, we understand that. We're fully unaware of what's going to happen. But we're going to try to get as much people. So please, if you haven't registered, please do that. So um, the flyers are in the back. And then um, we have updates from the programs. And the, the, we have Naji Kirby from Safe Kids. She's going to be presenting. And we're waiting on one thing. And that's Mima. We're trying to get a speaker for that because there's some, I guess, Ed. Ed, Ed had surgery, and I think that's who was supposed to speak. Ed McDonough was supposed to speak for us, but um, she sent a message, Holly sent a message saying that they have to change some people. Well, we'll get that taken care of. Um, as everybody knows, yesterday was Sparky's birthday. <laughs> Turned 71. It was the best day ever in uh, the Senate, man. It was like great. I was like, so my thought process several months ago was let me find every Sparky possible in the state of Maryland and bring them to Annapolis. And then it was curb your enthusiasm, tree sand, you're only getting one. So I was like, but he turned 75, I'm bringing, all, I'm bringing everybody that year. <laughs> I wanna fill the whole place up. So the Senate um, gave us a proclamation yesterday, uh, sent it to NFPA. Um, NFPA greatly appreciates Maryland because the fire marshal, you were the first one to tweet out after we did, and um, they were very excited to see these different things. Um, we worked with the Maryland Fire Museum a couple of weeks ago. We did some fire prevention birthday stuff for him, and I'm gonna send that up to them also. I didn't wanna send it too early because I didn't want anybody to see what we were doing, <laughs> but um, I was very excited for that. Um, they're very appreciative of our efforts. You know, Sparky 71, it was created just as an aspect of you know helping children ed educate everything. The funny part is, yesterday, they were looking for a live Dalmatian. I'm like, where's the Dalmatian? Um, Sparky's the Dalmatian. So, um, a little, like, thought process there. Um, yeah, <laughs> like, hello. Um, so, what was also neat was to have the canines come down, because at first we were told they would only be able to go to the gallery, and then we were gonna do a big picture on the steps, and then, but they all brought them down, and I thought that was really cool. President Ferguson, he actually, ditch part of the meeting so he could go meet the dogs. Which I was like, dude, aren't you supposed to be in that room over there? He goes, I don't care about that, I want to see the dogs. So that actually pretty well. And um, the biggest thing, and I'll do it under legislative, but you know, they were very supportive of us yesterday. They, 
They yep. said great things for us, and um, they know we're working hard. So our, our committee works very, very hard mm -hmm. to, to make these mm -hmm. changes. And um, I'm partnering right now with Montgomery County Fire Department with Beth Ann. We're going to be doing a program for online learning for students with low income, high needs. And um, we've been dealing with three schools in Montgomery County. I have two schools in Baltimore County and a school in Prince George's County that we're using. And what's unique about this is First Lord has given us a smoke alarm for every child that we're going to be helping. We're going to be putting it in their bedroom. And Beth Ann is working with the locations for the schools so that they can get permission to actually mount it in the bedroom other than what would be required by the code. And then um, something I was going to bring today, but I had to give it to somebody so they could use it. I'm bringing you all some new technology tomorrow. Um, I should have it back tonight. Uh, Knox Box is now in the process of creating smoke alarms and CO alarms. And it's a unique position because their alarms will be in English and Spanish. What's also unique is what um, Knox has done is they are actually working with 21 different countries and they're going to be building their smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms with that secondary language to that country. That's a big task for them, but they, they have fully embraced it. So you would think Knox has always been that wall, the box on the wall, you get the master keys to your location, then you go into it. They felt they needed to expand their abilities and support the country in a little bit different ways. Um, what I also feel, and I did a post about this, and I told people I was not being bought off by, by Knox, but they really, really took all the thought process that the fire service has been telling them, and they created a very sound device. In English and in Spanish, it also ta has a countdown of the amount of years that you have left on the device. Um, Neil Zipser had his, he had been using it for so much that um, once it's engaged, that's when the battery starts. That's the other thing. They, they wanted to keep that shelf life importance there because you could make all these smoke alarms and have them sit and then you go to use it and you only have like a month left. It, in, it engages just like the kid and the first alert ones do where it is actual turn that battery on when you put it into the base and that chirps signals it. They have vocal announcements, which is a big thing. It is not the L6 or LB, or you think you pounds lost that you would have on the carbon monoxide alarm. It states carbon monoxide present, and it even gives the parts per million, which I think is really um, ingenitive in this. So I'll have that tomorrow to show everybody. And then um, they are still working on the smoke alarm part of it. There's some concerns that they have. They want to see how some of the other companies have been dealing with this. And honestly, First Alert, Kitta, and Knox, they've actually been talking. You know, sometimes you'll get with those type of companies and they just go their different ways. But they really know that they have an ultimate responsibility. And they have been communicating with each other to embrace that they need to make this work for everybody. Now, the other two companies, they do not have an English and Spanish component. But they, they, they're all trying to do things to the, to the betterment. And then the next thing that... Um, Make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, Jennifer Williams um, with Underwriters Laboratory, which is now the Firefighters Research Foundation. She has incorporated something new. She's also one of our speakers on um, April 2nd. So we will have her there. And then um, we worked with the United States Fire Administration to get supplies. And I would just like to say, if you can, please come by. I know some of you are able to sign up, but I would like to see everybody there. You know, our ultimate goal is we wish to 100, but really right now because of COVID and the restrictions that need, it's not MIFRI, MIFRI would open the doors all the way, but um, hopingly having the online aspect and thanking Chris to be there, um, we have to be done by a certain hour because he has to go play hockey that day. Um, <laughs> um, I just, I think hockey it's, is hockey is life, that's right. And then, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best, we get it out there. Um, today's fire prevention display is all about camping safety. Um, it jogged my, my head like my brother just bought a camper and I started asking him questions. And his camper actually came with a smoke alarm that's installed in the um, camper. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I asked him about a carbon monoxide alarm and he goes, that, no. I'm like, well, maybe you can get one. But um, the price point on the carbon monoxide alarm from Knox, I was very shocked. It's only $30. That's what they told us, but Walmart sell them for $40.50.
you can't beat that for something new technology usually you're looking at a couple hundred bucks sometimes they were very important about bringing that price down so i'll have that device tomorrow other than that i think we're done Anybody any else? questions thank you all thank you, thank you. steve cox from uh, mifri if i could jump you in ahead of you ronnie because he's got to get out of here i was just informed sorry <laughs> Keep jiggling the numbers. Make make me money. Make me money. There's plenty of room up here. He'd come up here and sit next to me. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Michael Cox, Executive Director of MIFRI. Just wanted to uh, provide some updated information for you guys of our activities over the past uh, or since the December meeting. Uh, first and foremost, the uh, University Systems of Maryland's uh, COVID vaccination and testing uh, stuff. Uh, anybody coming to the College Park facilities is supposed to be vaccinated. That includes all faculty, staff, instructors, and students. Uh, and that vaccination, full vaccination requirement uh, requires that a booster, uh, be, you'd be boosted to have the uh, full vaccination. So. Um, the next line is what's really important. Those not fully vaccinated must take a COVID test once a week. So uh, the university has put that information out there. We're enforcing this at our College Park facility. Uh, what I wanted to let you all know is that any of our regional training facilities, we're going by the local health department and county's requirements there, uh, not by what the University System of Maryland has put out for us. Uh, in College Park, masks are still required in classrooms and uh, we are requiring them in the uh, regional centers also. All right, and then uh, any changes, you know, we'll be sure to update you guys. Uh, the, I did submit a report uh, electronically, so you guys should have access to that. Uh, EMTB uh, programs, that's a little long, uh, but I left in the first uh, and second and third pilot programs before the EMT was released out of pilot. Uh, which we did just uh, last semester. So uh, some of the numbers were in for that, so, uh, and that was considered to be a 21 uh, class. So uh, there was uh, about 1,158 students that started the EM classes, uh, EMT classes during that time. About 259 have uh, withdrawn from the programs uh, on their own, uh, 698. Uh, finished the class, 642 tested national registry, 67% uh, pass rate, uh, first attempt, and then the second and third attempts were 76.48. So uh, above the national registry average, uh, that was 67 and 71%. So uh, we're above that by about uh, five or six. And uh, so far this semester in 22, uh, for the FY22 numbers, there's 46 EMT classes scheduled to be run, uh, about a little over a thousand students that are enrolled, and um, only a few have tested out. And so far, the 115 that have tested out, there was a 73% pass rate on the first attempt, and uh, by the second and third attempts, if they had to go back, it's an 85% uh, pass rate. So I wanted to make sure all the numbers are in there so you all could digest them if you wanted to in there. Um, we're seeing a fair amount of success with it. The, uh, and I tell you, I would love to take the credit for it, but I can't. The credit goes to Diane May, our uh, planning section chief. Diane's a longtime instructor trainer and instructor at MIFRI. Uh, came into that position and then she has uh, whipped this stuff into shape. There still has been a couple classes across the state that were uh, troubling, but I think we just uh, one tested yesterday or the day before from somewhere that had dismal results in the beginning and uh, Diane had them go back, do the work that they're required to do. And uh, all but one, I think, in that class had gotten uh, through and passed uh, the class. So. Uh, those three classes that I'm aware of, the issues there were not just a student uh, issue where they sometimes weren't completing the required work that they're supposed to do, but there were some issues with the instructors too, which is uh, being uh, addressed and will be taken care of. So, um, ALS research program, uh, that's uh, running well. That's a new program, 30 hours. Anybody's paramedic attends that. It's a four-day program, seven and a half hours a day. 
uh, nothing online, all hands-on. No exams, no tests, just all online and approved uh, by National Registry uh, for recertification. So the rescue technician program I mentioned in December, I want to mention again, that's a new program, eight hours, and it's compliant with the Maryland protocol based on uh, Stop the Bleed and the Rescue Task Force standards that were put out um, and mentioned by the governor's uh, active assailant uh, task force. Uh, the test item analysis, as we were switching programs and moving to a tablet testing format, uh, we lost the ability to give the, uh, any uh, test item analysis, and that's usually a program where you can get a printout of whatever um, test that someone might have taken and it'll tell them what areas that they need to uh, brush up on. So that has uh, been put in place again and the rollout has already begun in uh, north, the Northeast region, the uh, Upper Eastern Shore region, and I believe they're going to North Central next and then they'll uh, hit Southern Maryland, uh, Western Maryland, then the Lower Eastern Shore. So that all should be rolled out and uh, we're expecting the full implementation to be done by uh, summertime. So the folks will have some feedback on any of the tests uh, that they take. All right, uh, there's a bunch of class information in there, which classes are in pilot, which ones are currently being revised, uh, which ones the SME groups have now, and what uh, courses are slated for revisions. I'm not gonna read through all them uh, for you and bore you with that. So uh, one thing I did wanna mention in, some of the various different counties that have their own ATRAs. Uh, we had originally scheduled ATRA visits uh, between January and June of 22. Uh, however, we were contacted by uh, Pro Board and they've pushed those visits off for a year. So uh, we've moved ours uh, back off uh, to January to June of 23 before Pro Board comes in to do the uh, visit. So and, and in preparation for that, we'll make sure that state after reaches out to all the locals, let them know we're coming and uh, go through all the steps that we need to prepare for that national uh, visit. Uh, you heard Teresa and uh, Cindy talk about uh, some of the seminars. There was a rural water supply uh, officer seminar on the 26th of March in College Park. Uh, the fire safety and uh, public life safety uh, program on April 2nd, uh, the Fabscom is uh, sponsoring the Hoagland seminar is going to be scheduled for April 9th and 10th at Shady Grove uh, UMD facility and there is a fire ground contaminant exposure control uh, program that is going to be held on May 23rd 24th and we're asking any of you all from your volunteer combination combination departments please 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 let your uh, health and safety officers know about that have them go on the web page and sign up uh, for the seminar. So uh, this is part of a grant that we partnered with the Fire Protection Engineering Section at the University of Maryland. And they're studying uh, you know, the contaminants, not the contaminants themselves, but the process of uh, minimizing the effects or exposure to contaminants and what difficulties the health and safety officers are having trying to get things in place uh, in their departments. There is a uh, professional development uh, scheduled for May 1st. That'll be in College Park. Uh, Maryland weekend uh, occurred back on the 26th, 27th of February. There were six different class deliveries for that. Our National Staff and Command program was held March 6th and 11th. That was held in Annapolis, Maryland. We had 75 people attend that from 22 different states around the country. Had some great speakers, uh, Dr. Griffin and uh, um, Rokovina, Gassaway. Um, Dave Statter was out with uh, Mark Brady. But they had a great uh, program all, all week long. We got great reviews on the program. So uh, Pearson View uh, test centers were up over 1,400 tests. And then uh, the only capital project we have going on right now is the Western Maryland capital project. So uh, they are getting ready to finish up the footers. That was delayed a little bit. The contractors continued to dig in a certain area where they probably shouldn't have dug and uncovered an underground tank and some other stuff, which caused us to go through a whole bunch of stuff. So thank goodness the water and soil tested clean. <laughs> 
but now they had to make a, I want to say it was a bridge, wasn't it, Steve? They had a, a bridge. They had to have an engineer design to put the footer in over top of this thing uh, for the addition to the building out there. But it's moving forward. That's uh, we're past all that now. So the uh, instructor skills is uh, still going on, and um, I know that has been a hot topic around the uh, state for many jurisdictions. Uh, about instructors and uh, we've really seen an uptick recently in many of our uh, programs and requests for programs so many that we're having difficulty finding instructors for some of the programs um, part of the cause is that is most of the metro uh, departments have been having back to back back to back back to back fire academies so many of their instructors that teach for us are committed uh, teaching for their own departments at the present time so um, but instructor skills, anyone from any of your departments is interested in uh, becoming an instructor. We have uh, made changes where the uh, traditionally the skills programs, uh, everybody had to come to College Park and get them and have it done. We don't need to do that. It, we'll take a road show on the road. We will come to your counties, your departments, your towns, and do a skills program uh, for them there. We've already uh, tested it out in Anne Arundel and up in Frederick great success and uh, we will move on so no more having to come to College Park for a skills program we'll, we'll take it wherever we got to take it around the state to get some more uh, stru instructors uh, on the books so uh, with that said the latest MICRB numbers are there's a total of 788 instructors in the state that's all instructors included and uh, 21 of those are instructor trainers, which are important for us because they're the ones that teach our instructor training programs. And then last but not least, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to echo some of the sentiments I heard earlier about the MSFA Legislative Committee. Um, Mr. Marlette usually takes care of that for us, attends the uh, meetings on Friday mornings, and I've uh, had the opportunity to sit in uh, when he couldn't a few times this year, and that group is just, uh, you really can't describe it. It's without words uh, to describe what they do day in and day out, not only for you all in the MSFA, but for every other organization that sits in that room uh, that's part of the Maryland EMS Fire Rescue uh, Program. So they have done a great job, and uh, Robert and um, his uh, whole group there, uh, Jimmy and uh, Richard Smith and uh, Teresa, and all of them, you know, folks from the fire marshal's office, they have done an outstanding job. And to go into the room and it uh, not be keeping up with that stuff uh, to walk in and just be updated and be, you know anyone doesn't attend that meeting from their organizations doing a serious disservice to them so great job to them kudos so with that said i'll answer any questions anyone will have any questions for the director of Miffrey? mr Good. i'm sorry everybody It is written in our student guide that they can't miss any sessions. However, we know there are circumstances that are not their fault and uh, are very limited. And if they let the instructor know, we will work with them to make sure whatever work is missed will be made up uh, for that. Another question, e e mm -hmm. is all virtual? Uh, no. Uh -uh. Yes. Whatever county will not recognize or make for your program. Okay. For the virtual program? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think we were doing, we might have been doing that during COVID just to get folks through, but that's all going back to face-to-face uh, -face and uh, skills programs. But they still have to complete the skills. Right. Even though the instruction is virtual. Yes, program. absolutely. Okay, that's clarifying. Like, yep. Back on. Thank you. Yep. No, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Two two quick questions, uh, and the first one came to me uh, from someone else. Have have we looked at, or, or are we looking at the fail rate for uh, other classes other than EMT? I know we spend a lot of time on EMT, but uh, the two that he came to me with was firefighter one and uh, the uh, rescue tech uh, site ops class. Are, are, are we seeing an increase in the fail rate there? Not to my, uh, not to my notch. I know we have had some people uh, fail that, Dan. But again, 
uh, with the switch over to the new learning management system that occurred two years ago, Canvas, there is a bunch of work that is in Canvas for all classes. And uh, Firefighter 1 uh, is one of them. And if the, if the folks, the students, aren't doing that and the instructors aren't paying attention to them not doing that, then that's going to create a problem for them. Okay. So that's why we believe uh, there was a few classes where we've seen that with a few pe uh, classes. But when we go back and look at the, um, the all classes in totality, the, the ones that are you know, uh, completing the work that is required for the program, we have no problems with this great pass rate. Okay, thank you. And the other question, uh, we uh, met with uh, Tracy Verzi with the State Board of Education mm -hmm. on this two-year program, which I'm, I know you're very f familiar with. But the thing that came out, the, the classes that uh, are mandated under that two-year, in other words, they, they have a schedule of the classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I figured it, there's uh, only about 500 hours that uh, those classes take. But if you take a two-year program, that's 1,080 hours. So uh, something's got to happen to those kids for that extra 580 hours. And uh, uh, I, I asked her, I said, so what we're talking about here is an unfunded mandate because the state says we've got to have a two-year program, but they only list about 500 hours. And I'm, those 500 hours obviously are going to be taught by you all. But is there any thought that, that hours for those programs, hours could be added to, to say, EMT uh, or that MIFRI could pick up any of those hours because it, it's uh, going to be a burden of about uh, just rough figures at $25 an hour would be about uh, $14,000 for the local jurisdiction to, to pay somebody, for want of a better word, babysit those kids for, the, for that extra 500 and some hours. Yeah. So I, or, are you all open to discussions on that? or We're always open to discussions. Uh, the only thing we would like to see is something standardized across the board. I know it has to be, it can't be standardized to the point where it's forced on someone. You know, it's got to fit into each of the individual jurisdictional uh, programs. Um, however, what we want to see is the standardization in the type of uh, program that it would be, yeah. you know. Yep. In other words, something that's beneficial for them uh, instead of the, now, and I haven't uh, been in the last couple of meetings that they've had with uh, Tracy and uh, Steve, have you had last one you want to touch yeah, on that? Yeah, if I can yep. jump in here for just a second. Uh, one of the issues that, that I've had discussions with her is different programs have different hours. For example, some of your programs in Southern Maryland, you have the students five days a week, three hours a day. Some of the counties, they only have them three days a week for an hour and a half. That's why their overall program, and we've been talking about that, how can we make it standard? The overall state program was addressing those particular uh, counties that had the restricted hours, and they weren't looking at like Southern Maryland, Harford County, and all where we have them for three hours, five days a week. More to follow on that. Yeah, because I mean the program is two years for for either one of those. Yeah. So, and if right. if you have the the 540 hour, uh, which is three hours a day, uh, you, you're way short on on putting those somebody somebody's got to watch those kids or, or teach them something. And uh, I know we can possibly add some classes, but uh, it's still 582 hours. I think is a lot to make up. Okay, we'll maybe more on that because we're still uh, uh, the committee is still working on that. So yeah, so. And, I mean we can think outside the box about that, Dan. I mean even if it was a telecommunicator class or something, that's something that's beneficial to the students when they leave there. You know, uh, you know whatever we can make fit, but we just got to make sure the state board of education approves that stuff. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Take right. care. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Financial branch, I'm sorry. Yeah, financial boys, come on up. VCAP, you want to start heading this way?
Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, you should have gotten three documents in the reports. There should be a balance sheet as of February 28th, a profit and loss statement for July 2021 through February of 2022, and there should be a budget versus actual for July 2021. July 2021 through June of 2022. Are there any questions on any of the numbers? Awesome. So uh, just a couple of points that I have and then my, my partners here will do some reports. But uh, we have filed all of the 1099s for the MSFA. Uh, those go to our contractor staff. They go to the uh, widows and orphans who get the uh, funding through us, along with the Bessie Marshall recipients. All of the W2Gs, which is related to the gaming from the raffle, have been mailed out to the individuals, and all those documents have been filed with the Internal Revenue Service. Our tax return is in the process of being completed by Fight Connor and Associates, which is the accounting firm in Lavelle that we use and they're also preparing the financial review, which is conducted every year, which is uh, a complete analysis of all of the accounts, all the expenditures, and then the executive committee is usually given a hard copy written report at your last executive committee meeting in June in Ocean City. So that is in uh, full process. Uh, we're, we're monitoring where the governor's budget proposal will be. Uh, we understand that the appropriations fund is scheduled to again be funded at 400000 and the relief fund uh, will continue with the 375. plus our understanding is that there's a proposed increase of 250000 on top of that for the Widows and Orphans Fund. Relative to the SAFER grant, and I don't want to take uh, uh, any of Kate's uh, report, but uh, the contractors that have been hired, a payroll system has been developed for each of the subcontractors that we're using who are administering the SAFER grant. Uh, several are using direct deposits, ACH as it's called, through the banking industry. And so uh, we are doing payroll on the 20th of every month. And uh, that uh, includes all the other documentation required for direct deposit. Uh, the budget has been loaded completely into our QuickBooks, which is a piece that the Budget Committee Chair will report on in just a minute. I have one item that uh, I would like the Executive Committee to, to, to be aware of. I've been meeting with PNC, that is our primary checking account company, and they have a new program called a Treasury Enterprise Fund. It is a different version of a checking account. The two benefits are it provides additional, additional program benefits because of the amount of money we keep in our account, in our operating account every year, because our checking account is, is over a million dollars now uh, in totality. And um, the other piece is that because of that different component of programming, the amount of annual fees are reduced because of the amount of cash that you have in the account. In addition, the other pieces they connect with our credit card service, which is what we use for predominantly the convention, and it reduces some of the credit card fees. So the finance team needs to do a little bit more research on that, but I at least wanted to bring it to the executive committee that the finance team may be making a recommendation that we want to go to this different style checking account, and we'll need your approval to do that downstream once we get through that. Uh, that is uh, the extent of my comments, so I will turn it over to the Financial Secretary. Good afternoon, everyone. Mitch Folk, Financial Secretary. Um, as you know, this is my busy time of the year with the dues. Uh, the initial notices were mailed out on December the 17th. Second notices for those who hadn't paid yet were mailed out on February the 15th. And then about two weeks ago, I notified members of the executive committee of any outstanding invoices that hadn't been paid from your uh, ju jurisdictions. Um, and um, I just want to give you a little story. Uh, two weeks ago in the mail, I received a return to sender. And I said, 10th District Volunteer Fire Company. And I looked at it and said, 
I'm sure they paid. And I went back and looked, and yes, they had. Then I looked at the postmark. It was 13 months ago, and I just got it two weeks ago, return to sender. So based on that, I'm going to read the list I haven't got yet. And two of these are always good. I've never had, had this, so I don't know if this is what happened twice on them. So in Anne Arundel County, I have Rivera Beach, Frederick County, Walkersville Rescue. Hmm? Okay. Uh, Garrett, Northern Garrett Rescue. Montgomery County is Bethesda. PG County, I have Volunteer Marine Fire and Rescue. Riverdale Heights. And Seat Pleasant. And Seat Pleasant was double billed because they still owe from last year. So they got a double bill this time. It was $400 invoice. Um, and then our associate members, Montgomery County Department of Fire and Rescue, and again, that's double billed from last year, and PG Fire and EMS Department. And we have one sustaining member, that's VFIS, and I'm going to send Jerry Poland a direct email uh, and see if he can take care of that one. And again, it could be due to, to the Postal Service not getting them there. Uh, as far as the assistant financial secretary, Bobby has advised me that the inventory is up to date and uh, she just needs a couple receipts and she is working on those. And uh, that's my report for now. Anything like that? Go ahead. Okay. All right, budget chair. Thank you. Uh, Steve Cox, budget committee chair. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Yeah. President, for those changes in the budget committee. Uh, the new vice chair and the new appointment. Uh, certainly appreciate that because our busy time is going to be coming up. Uh, requesting that everyone asking for a budget, submit your budget. We're going to make sure that the form gets put on the web so that it's easily obtainable and you can just fill it out. Uh, return it to budget at msfa.org. And we're asking that those requests be in by May 1st. Mm -hmm. And even if the budget yeah, yeah. that you're requesting, oh, you want to stay exactly as you were, uh, yeah. because I've been using uh, documents from two or three years ago, submitting them to the committee for consideration, and we've developed the budgets based on those. Uh, if you're looking for something, or even if you want to stay the same, we need something from you asking, leave me at what we are or whatever so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, other than that, uh, we have made a couple adjustments. Uh, as we've talked about before, when a, a committee has something that comes up, if uh, their particular line item has been a little slim, and we've had money in a different account that we've been able to communicate and move those funds to uh, fulfill the need. We've made those modifications. And uh, other than questions, that would be the report of the Budget Committee. I hear no questions. Any questions for any of the financial team? Okay. Mr. Chair, that's our report. Thank you, sir. VCAF. You want me to do Ways and Means? Oh, yeah, while here? you're sitting there, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, we attended Sunfest in Ocean City and the Darlington Apple Fest. Uh, the farm fair was canceled due to COVID. This was back in the summer. Uh, so far this year, we have uh, produced $15,943, and that is comparable to the pre-COVID year. So we're, we're getting back to semi-normal with the, uh, with the uh, raffle. Um, Next large event will be Spring Fest. It will be coming up in a, in a month or two. It will be Thursday, May 5th through Sunday, May 8th uh, in the nice, hopefully warm inlet of Ocean City. Uh, we have plenty of room. We have a 10 by 20 tent this year, so we've got plenty of room that we can use some help. Um, and that would be the report. Thanks, Mitch. Appreciate Thank it. Sell those tickets. Get the money to Mitch. Sell the tickets. Yes. And I have them if anybody needs uh, Joe, VCAF. Uh, legislative branch is next. So, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Cumberland, Mr. Bilger, Mr. Underwood. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Simpkins, members of the uh, Executive Committee. Uh, on February the 23rd, uh, BCAF met by Zoom to discuss uh, Arundel Volunteer Fire Company's uh, application 8260 for a project for a new rescue squad, a total cost of $1,135,021. Uh, Captain Ryan Ayers uh, gave a pre brief overview of the application. Uh, after a brief discussion, a uh, motion was made by John Gatton Sr. to approve their loan request with a 15-year payback at 1% interest in the amount of $735.21. Motion was seconded by Tim Gantley. Uh, with no discussion on the motion, the motion was approved and passed. So here today is uh, Chief Ayers and, uh, to discuss any questions you may have. Uh, they are asking to, to borrow about 64%, I believe, of the value of the truck, as the rest of the money will come from 508 money and company funds. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I move we accept and approve the application from Arundel Company 7. I have reviewed the application documents and uh, find them to be substantial, and the request is certainly warranted. Second. Who's the second? Bobby. Any questions? Any insight, Ryan? Anything? Uh, got a new, new baby coming? No? No. <laughs> All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You got some money. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to come, but that's the way it has to be. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Also, uh, at this time, the balance uh, prior to this approval in the uh, money allowable to lend was uh, six million nine hundred fourteen thousand five hundred eighty-four dollars and thirty-five cents, as given by Scott Gordon uh, last at the end of uh, last month. Also, VCAF has received uh, a letter, and I think it was part of what you got uh, from Tillman Island, that they requested that their loan uh, be withdrawn because they got a FEMA grant to cover their entire uh, cost of their SCBA equipment. So notifications were made to MEMA and to the association to that, that uh, amount of money be put back in our fund rather than taken out. So that's been taken care of. And uh, also uh, effective uh, at the end of the term, all uh, VCAF members have uh, requested to be reappointed uh, with the exception of, uh, of Frank Underwood and Charlie, Charlie Walker has been appointed to take his, his place. So any questions on that? Anything that I've given you? Everybody understand? Our next meeting is scheduled for August the 7th at a place to be determined depending on the amount of inquiries and applications that we have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe, for a great job. Congratulations to Arundel. Thank you. Legislative Branch, Joel and Crowd. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. For the record, Joel McCray, President and Legislative uh, Branch Director. Um, we've heard um, about the 75th anniversary of Sparky and the proclamation that was presented, 71st, sorry, 71st, and the proclamation that was presented uh, to recognize that. And this was done in the chambers of the Senate. Um, congratulate everybody that was down there. Thank Teresa Ann for uh, putting together the Sparky Dogs, etc. Uh, the le legislative team was on the floor in the Senate. And I can tell you, as the senators filed in, um, there were lots of hugs and fist bumps and handshakes and recognition of the legislative team. So I can tell you from that, I can... I can see the legislative team is doing their job. Um, they seem to know everybody, everybody knows them. 
and there was a lot of recognition from the senators they, as they did their comments of the team, actually of individuals, um, a lot of them related to um, specific incidents and relationships and, and what this team has done for them. So I can tell you from that point, um, this team is, is doing a great job. So, team? Call Chief Phelps first. Uh, Chief Phelps. Yes, sir. I have filed my report online, but I've yet to been able to find it. So I'm sure nobody else has it either. What I'd like to say, uh, President McKay, Vice Presidents, the uh, officers of the uh, LAMSFA, I'm, di I'm dyslexic, Chairman Simpkins, the uh, Legislative Office 17th State Circle has been staffed at least three and lately four days a week since the start of the 22 legislative season began. The days normally begin around 7.30 there and end around 1,500 or so. And um, since the, we started keeping track on this, or actually our front ladies keep track, uh, January we had uh, 26 days that we were there a total of 187 hours and 2,450 miles driven back and forth to take care of this. February, 50 days there, 416 hours, 4,500 miles driven. For a total of 76 days that we were there, uh, 603, uh, 603 hours and almost 7,000 miles driven, just taking care of legislative duties this year. This is in addition to uh, the ladies, uh, LAMSFA, 17 state circle that uh, help us in the front office. They contributed an additional 20 days, 132 hours, and another 1,400 some odd miles that they drove. What I'll say is these hours are reflected or for just for time there in the office. Many days and weekends and nights, it continues on. It's not a nine to five job. It's a 24 seven job. It happens all weekend long. This past weekend, um, member Smith, Richard Smith and myself received a request on Tuesday to gather information to be back for um, possible funding of fire companies for firefighter gear or washing machines. Came in Saturday around two o'clock and they wanted it back by noontime Tuesday. The legislative committee took care of it, made phone calls, sent emails, um, Kate sent it out. I personally took it upon myself or reached out to the fire chiefs, Bill Smith, the president of the fire chiefs, because I knew he had contacts quicker in some cases than we did. We put, we put together a report back to the uh, requesting people. It was a member of the House of Delegates that was asking for this, and we had um, I think we only had five jurisdictions that did not respond. So it was, it was quite an effort. Just to give you some idea, it's not just in the office. The um, people that meet on a regular basis in that office, uh, Vice Chair Malone, he was in here earlier, Vice Chair Crisman, she's on the phone and, uh, with us every day. She's not in our office, but she's on the phone every day. Without her efforts, we wouldn't have the, de uh, the weekly bulletin. And um, Harv Wood, he's the legislative chairman for the uh, fire chiefs. He's also in the office with us on a, on a weekly basis. We go to two regular meetings every week. Every Friday we have a meeting with the fire marshal's office. Every Monday we have a meeting with Delegate Holmes and his uh, fire EMS office. And it continues on like that all the time. This past, uh, during this past session, up till now, um, President uh, um, McCray and Vice President Kurtz actually came in, worked with us in the office, and gave testimony on bills. So it's, it's a real effort, it's everywhere. I can't say enough about the ladies in the front office. Marion Nicholson, Rosa Mayer, uh, Terry Hayden, and Barb McKay. If it wasn't for them, keeping the front office moving, keeping the paperwork filed, and keeping all the noise in the back office down to a circus level, 
uh, we wouldn't get a whole lot accomplished, I'll be honest with you. So it is, it's a full team effort there. Never, never seems to phase and fade. We started off this year, we had a few things that the president asked us to take a look at. Uh, we were looking at uh, getting language changed in the VCAF legislature to reflect the latest changes that they have to work with, with uh, MEMA becoming MDEM. He asked that we look at language in the Amos Funds legislature to allow a fire company to purchase property or rehab property that is not presently adjacent to their, the uh, home company. Uh, we were looking at getting the uh, income tax subtraction increased from $7,000 to $10,000 this year. And uh, we had a request from Vice President Kurtz that uh, lighting on fire police vehicles could be changed and it, uh, have uh, the lighting changed on their vehicles. Of these four requests, three of them made it into bills and the bills are moving forward. So we're making some progress on those particular cases. The one we didn't get any traction uh, trying to find a sponsor this year was a little hard because sponsors were limited in some respects and that was for the VCAF language and we're, we've already got plans to start working on that as soon as this session's over with. So it doesn't end. It's, a 90, it's not a 90-day uh, operation any longer. I'm not going to go over all the bills that we've got going on. I just want to name a couple uh, that, we've, that we've, we're following. It's something we call supporting with high importance. And of these, we have a um, House Bill 275, Senate Bill 273. It's called the PFAS Chemical Bill. This is a bill that deals with a chemical that we have in firefighting foam. This chemical is dangerous to the environment. It's deadly to humans. It can kill you. We're working uh, with, with many legislators and other partners trying to get this removed. These bills are moving forward. Uh, it's not a day goes by, there's not a conversation on one of these bills. The uh, House Bill 930, this has to do with the Senator Amos funds. Again, that can be used to purchase or re rehabilitate properties, not adjacent to a present firehouse property. Um, it's moving forward. Mm. We have, we've, we've heard uh, in here about um, schism teams and mental health. We have two bills, House Bill 581, Senate Bill 446. Peer support legislation to protect a conversation between firefighters and peer support personnel. Keep these private. It's moving forward, it's grab traction. And it's a lot of effort goes into these. Uh, and it's not just us, there's other partners that are taking place with this, but it's a, it's a combination, it's a, it's a coordinated effort. Um, Senate Bill 122 now has a uh, a companion bill, House Bill 1472. Senate Bill 122 has been stuck in a committee since back in, I guess, the 1st of February. But there's a House bill moving forward, and it's and it moving forward very rapidly. So we look we look for uh, some good things to come out of this. It's going to increase our income tax subtraction from $7,000 to $10,000. The um, House Bill 1066, I, I spoke about that just a second. This is a bill that will allow fire police to have red and white lights on their vehicles so they can better be identified at the scene of an emergency when they're away and you're trying to protect the people at the emergency. Uh, Senate Bill 10, Wartman's Compensation COVID-19 Presumption Bill for first responders. It's moving, we're working on that. Um, what I have here, and I'll, I'll close out real quickly with this, is that um, just since the bulletin was put out, this is how rapidly sometimes we're doing. Uh, Richard Smith has been back here in the corner already today, spending time watching the hearings so that we can stay up to date on these things. Um, House Bill 581, again, that's the uh, peer support bill. It's with mental health. Uh, has now, in just this week, it went for a second reader, passed that. Went for a third reader, it's uh, passed now to get their third reader. That's working for us. Uh, the Senator Amos bill has already crossed from one to the other. That was 316. Our gas piping bill that the uh, fire marshal was talking about uh, is on the floor today for a third reader. These are things that are just, they don't just happen, it takes an awful lot of work. 
and and it, it, we get a we get a bulletin. I'm sure everybody in here gets a bulletin every week. If you don't, please see Teresa and get it. And don't just get it and look at it. Read it. There's a there's an awful lot of information in here that all of us can keep up on, and it, it affects every one of us and everybody we represent, and it changes daily. I can tell you one thing, just personal. When I was asked to uh, be a part of this committee and then was asked to be a chairman, I didn't realize how deep the water was in that end of the pool. <laughs> it, it, it was a lot deeper than I thought it was. And I'm glad I'm a scuba diver and I can, I can do real well underwater. It doesn't bother me a lot. How's the water? Sir? How's the water? It's cold. It's cold. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like uh, <laughs> to thank everybody that supports me, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I couldn't do it without them. I've got a great team. Um, my co-chair, Teresa Crisman, and uh, Jim Malone are just great to work with. Uh, Richard Smith, he makes fun of me all day. I I'm his, uh, I'm, I'm like the clown jester or something, I believe. And uh, Harv Wood, uh, we work well as a team. Everybody's got a, a niche and, and we do it and we do it for our fire service. That's my report, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Federal Legislative Oversight Committee, Bob. Yes, sir. Thank Vice you, Mr. President Chairman. Cumberland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you all should have gotten my report. I submitted it early. Uh, I think it's earlier than I usually do, and I had to set a, submit a supplement because uh, a couple of bills come out uh, just after the report went in. But the big ones I highlighted was House Bill. Uh, 2471, which is the um, um, Amnesty uh, Appropriation for 2022. That was uh, released by the House and the Senate uh, Appropriations Committee on March the 8th. And the big thing in that is that uh, they cut uh, 10 million, they're looking at cutting uh, the AFG grant program and the SAFER grant program $10 million from what President Biden had requested. Um, as you well know, we all need this money. It's needed badly by all the car companies, especially, you know, with the past couple years with Cobalt and how our departments have taken the cut. So I encourage each of you to uh, get in contact with your uh, federal legislators and, uh, and encourage them to uh, not cut that money out of that. Uh, some of the requests that the president has put in that hasn't been uh, cut, but it will be increased is the U.S. Fire Administration, uh, Urban uh, Area uh, Security Initiative, State Home uh, Homeland Security Grant Program, the Volunteer Fire Assistance Program, uh, the Siren Rural EMS Grant Program, and the National Firefighter Cancer uh, Registry Program. So those bills are moving on. Another one that is key to us, uh, especially in our state, because we are the biggest supporter of sprinklers, is H.R. 6192, Senate 3346, which is high-rise sprinkler in Sunnyback. Uh, this legislation uh, would uh, help out in the tax code area because uh, under the tax code, sprinkler systems is looked at as plumbing. So. Uh, it's a, it's a big tax on that, and that would cut that uh, to recover funds, uh, reduce that to 15 years. So, you know, with the big high-rise fires that we had in New York and uh, in uh, Philadelphia, I think it's a key bill that we need to get on and support. And being, uh, you know, being supporters of uh, sprinkler legislation in our state, you know, we're a key leader in that area. So that would help them reduce that. And uh, the latest one to come out is uh, Senate Bill 623. That was introduced on Thursday, and that's the Sunshine, Sunshine Protection Act. And that would uh, make uh, daylight saving time standard year round. I don't know where that'll go anywhere, but uh, they're trying to have legislation to move that on. Uh, and then the other one is the uh, Safety stand down for 2022 is the week of June 19th and 24th. So 
those are the key things that uh, happened since our last executive committee. I know uh, President McCray has uh, some, uh, some stuff on the grant program that probably will fall in with the AFG program if it passes. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. I'd like to talk about House Bill, H.R. 3728. This was actually uh, introduced in June of 2021. It's sort of like lay dormant and has gained some traction now. And what this, does, what this is to do is to provide grants for fire station construction uh, through, the, through FEMA. Um, basically looking at um, providing grants to build or, or renovate a fire or EMS facility. Uh, Senator Ben Holland's office has reached out to us um, on the state level to try to get a sense of what does this mean to Maryland. How many stations in Maryland would be in need of these funds and what type of projects and the dollar amounts. This, uh, they equate it uh, to, um, in 2009, the American Recovery Act that was a, a one-time appropriation for station construction grants through the um, AFG. It was about $225 million. Um, at that time, those projects had to be shovel-ready and completed within a year. There's a good chance that could be similar for this type of funds. And the funds are not to totally fund your project, but to provide a, I'll put it this way, a gap um, grant to get you over the line. You may already have funding you've raised through community uh, fundraisers and maybe some other sources, but there's still a gap to get you over the line to complete the project. Uh, so uh, the center's office wants to know, what does this mean to Maryland? If this were to happen, um, what would Maryland need? What would they be looking for in, in dollar amounts and projects? So I'm working with Joe Anchesky, um with the BCAP team to reach out to the counties uh, to gather this information. Um, they, they have a pretty good sense of the building projects that have been brought to them, but they could not do, they cannot do because of the lack of funding. So um, I've asked that group to take this on and try to gather information. So all of your executive committee members, uh, you are aware of what we're looking for in your county. Uh, if you have happen to have that information already gathered on the county level, uh, get in touch with Joe and help him put that together. They asked for a turnaround of about two weeks, if we could get that to them in a you know, two-week time frame. So I'm just throwing it out there. It's not a given, it's still in progress, but the Senator wants to know, you know, what does this mean to Maryland? H.R. 3728. If, if this goes through and does pass, as the President said, uh, in 2009 and 10, I think, in the AFG program, uh, they were the group that administered that program, and I think there was a cap on how much that was trying to remember back when they did that that one year program and i think it was like the, maybe 10 or 15 million dollars was the, was the cap on that program <laughs> so if if this bill does pass and go through i'm almost sure it will fall under fema and the the afg office that handles that uh, and in my conversation with Joel, there's two main categories for this bill. New construction, <coughs> renovations, and additions. We need it separated when we get to totals because we're not mind readers, Joel or I. We cannot determine. So when you submit it, it must be whether it's new construction or renovations. Also, it does not include purchase of property, architectural design, uh, licenses and fees, any of that. It's strictly bricks and mortar. That's all they're looking for. And and uh, there's going to be an email go out to VCAF committee members offer, uh, asking the same questions from them, and uh, hopefully the district reps from the executive committee and the VCAF can work together to put these totals together. 
because uh, Senator uh, Van Hollen's office would like them uh, like April the 7th or in that ballpark time frame, yes? No, he answered it. He answered it. But that, that's where we're at. So uh, it's, it's a step forward. Like I say, it's not going to pay for everything, but it'll at least get you, if, if you're 80% of the way done, of money raised or 50, maybe it'll help you get to that 100%. That's all I have. Currently in Hempstead, we're trying to build a new firehouse, $8 million. We were also told that our costs have gone up 25% since we initiated this project, so now we're out looking for another $1.25 million. And also remembering uh, from the, the 2009 program, you got to make sure when the uh, to when the guidance go program guidelines come out, read all them guidelines because you're going to need all your permits and everything in in row before you submit that grant. Just to let you know. But the big thing there is just like with the AFG program, make sure you read the guidelines, pick out the key words in there to help you get that money, and follow those guidelines. Good. Mark, anything on fire law books? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Currently, the State Fire Prevention Commission continues to work with the Fire Marshal's Office on updating the State Fire Prevention Code. It has been cleared by the Department of State Police. It is now sitting in the committee, AELR committee, which I've been told they will not do anything with it until the session ends at the, uh, in, in April. So we continue to wait for the process to move forward. Hopefully that we will still be able to produce a book sometime in 2022. But we continue to, uh, again, just wait for the process to go through. Thank you. Frank, 17 State Circle. All right, let me tell you something about government bureaucracy if you want to hear something about that. <laughs> All right. I think we're quite aware, everybody in the room doesn't know anything about it. In, in <laughs> September of 2019, Prior to that, I know the lease was running out in September. I made a trip up to Baltimore to the office up there, made a copy of the lease, took it into a young lady at the desk. She looked up 17 State Circle, says, sir, it's not in our system. Okay, but don't worry, we'll take care of it. So a young gentleman came out and took the copy, says, yeah, I'm replacing such and such who retired, but I will take care of it, all right? now." Two years plus later, every other Monday I make a phone call, which turned out to be the big wig in charge of all this stuff. Uh, a couple of times I have faxed him copies, offered to take him copies. And anyway, uh, eventually, after I get numerous things of, sorry, the mailbox is busy, or the gentleman answers and said, I'll have Mrs. So-and-so um, call you. She is the one that takes care of that area. Two years later, after talking to this guy a couple of times, I finally, a couple weeks ago, Monday morning, 8 o'clock, I get on the phone. It's every other week I call him. In between, I call other people and bitch about something, all right? But the idea was, uh, Mr. Underwood, I remember you. You're the one for 17 State Circle. I said, yeah. And I've explained to him a numerous times that you're not going to find that address in your system. Uh, last year, we did some major re uh, renovations to 17 State Circle, and I went to the uh, Historical Society. We don't have a 17 state circle listed, sir. You must be wrong. No, I have. I end up taking the guy up the street and showing it to him. All right. Here it is, sir. Right here. Uh, anyway, we still are not on record of 17 state circle as far as historical people, but they know the buildings there. All right. Because we've done brickwork and other stuff on it. Uh, about three weeks ago now, Monday morning, 8 o'clock, I called. Talked to the big wig, surprised the hell out of me. Eight o'clock Monday, he was there. He says, Mr. Underwood, I remember you. You still haven't gotten it taken care of? Didn't Mrs. So-and-so call you? Nope. Man gets on the phone, third party. He says to the lady, why in the hell haven't you called this gentleman back? So it didn't take long. It was about 15 minutes later, I got a text message. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I've been assigned to 17 State Circle, the lease. Um, the major gentleman sent her a copy, he had her email, he sent her a copy of it. Uh, so I talked to her, nice lady, 
But she says, you know, this isn't going to happen overnight. And I kind of very, very nicely told her in a nice way, yeah, I know that, you know. So anyway, they have a copy of the lease, which all you got to do is change the damn date on it and send it back through. Uh, well, we have to send it first off. We have to make any changes. We have to send it to legal. Once legal gets it, we will send it to you guys for your approval. Once it gets the approval, it has to go in front of the Board of Public Works. We know how long that takes, okay? Even though I get the comptroller's listing of the things and somewhere along the way. So anyway, it is in progress, but don't worry because they can't find it. We could have sold the damn thing and built ourselves something there over the years of history. Mr. Yanger would flip over in his grave because he wants the front steps changed. We could have done it and nobody knows it's there. I'll be honest with you. So we do have progress. I thank the financial committee for the work that we have been able to do there. It is in pretty good shape. Um, once the legislation ends, we'll go in and clean the carpet. And I got some other minor things to do in the bathroom inside. It's an old building, we're gonna do that. So anyway, once we become legal, uh, I will bring you a copy of the lease. And that, and that is my report, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. You make us smile each time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It is the outhouse, basically, for the building next door. <laughs> Who, they had a lawyer's office in there for a while, so that, that improvises the part about being an outhouse. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, that, so. <laughs> that proves the point. That proves the point. Thank you, folks, for your report. And, um, Frank, thank you for all your work on the VCAF committee. I know you've been there and uh, Joe has complimented. Well, there is, there is reasons, reasons that I am giving it up is because I have peaked out in dealing with people's garbage. I will call you, sir, I will give you this, I will give you that, but they wait till the day before it, this time runs out and they will call you and expect you to jump and go and it's more than one day's worth of work to do that. So I have to give up something other because of my mental stress, and that's number one. And a good old Chuck with a new heart, he's got the 40-some-year-old heart. He can handle it better than I am. He's going to take it. Very good. Thank you, folks, for your reports. You went to out-of-state. You got a, I was going to ask you have an out-of-state. That was on the list. <clears throat> yeah, fortunately this year, like we are right now. Benny, you're up. Every state's going back to Holton in person conventions and I did submit that report earlier uh, to the uh, committee but uh, just to give you some dates of course the uh, Congressional Fire Service dinner is coming up uh, April 6 and 7 uh, Cumberland Valley's uh, convent a booster meeting will be May 14 to 15 and their convention is August 3rd through 6 uh, the booster meeting is in Greencastle and the convention will be in Williamsport, Maryland at uh, Williamsport Fire and EMS Company. The Virginia Firefighters Association uh, convention and will, or conference, excuse me, conference and expo will be back at the Hampton Roads Convention Center and that's August 10th and 13th. West Virginia's is the same time, August the 10th and 13th at the John Marshall High School in uh, Marshall County. Uh, Pazney's convention is also August 10th through the 13th, and that's in Terrytown, uh, New York. Delaware's convention again this year will be at the Chase Center on the riverfront in Wilmington, and that's the 14th and the 16th. And the Firefighters Association State of Pennsylvania are uh, are partnering with the Pennsylvania Fire and Emergency Services Institute. That will be held at the Best Western Conference Center in Harrisburg, and that's October 10 to 22nd. And uh, I did get some information we've never attended, unfortunately, uh, other than some of our Maryland companies that belong to Delmarva, but they're, they're hosting a convention at Hartley, Delaware on the 5th, 6th, and 7th of May. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Convention branch under the direction of uh, First Vice President Benny Kurtz. 
So we're looking for Ron Sarnicky, Wally Daniels, Donaldson, Robert Jacobs, Tom Mattingly, Ken Bush, and Kate Loveless. Dave Lewis will be coming up for Wiley. Okay. And then uh, leave the administration branches after these guys. Real quick, as everyone's getting a seat, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, everyone's had an opportunity to uh, hear about the convention center uh, expansion at Sea Hall and some of the exciting changes that are being done uh, as far as when the exhibits open and all, and I will refer that to the rest <coughs> of the committee. So, Ron, go ahead, take it. Thank you. Uh, Ron Sarnicky, convention chair, and the team is here. Uh, pleasure to be back. Uh, got just a couple of things to uh, cover for you. First of all, if you've been on the uh, website, we have done some enhancements to the convention site. Uh, there is direct links to the home page of the MSFA. That was one of the pieces that people said sometimes it was difficult to navigate to the convention site from the home page. So that's been taken care of. Thank you to the Secretary's Office. The first mail out has been sent along with the exhibitor packages and registration is in full, full bore right about now with both uh, credentials, which I'm sure the Secretary will talk about at some point, uh, registration for our exhibitors, and our program book ads are, are going full stream. We're getting ready for the second mail out. That'll, that uh, will depend upon uh, the one action item is for you all to approve the preliminary agenda, which is required in the bylaws for the executive committee to say you're okay with that agenda that we'll propose. And that second mail out will include the hotel motel information, which will be posted on the website as well, and then other documents that I know that the Secretary's Office relative to awards wants to get out. Uh, a lot going on with the educational programs. Uh, again, we have hot training. I know Kate's going to cover a little bit of this and main program presentations. So, Kate, if you want to hit on education for a little bit, please. So the schedule of education classes and seminars are posted online. I don't foresee any changes being made to them at this point. All of the instructors have been confirmed, uh, including um, some training, by, well, hands-on training and in-class seminars by OC, uh, OC Pools. Uh, thank the partners, Midfrey and MIMS, for their participation in sending instructors and classes. We have over 55 classes this year, which is the largest that we've had in quite some time down at the beach. So. Please encourage your departments to register for the classes. They can get training points, uh, low set points through their departments if the departments uh, cho choose to uh, honor those points for training. And I will work with MIMS to get some of the EMS classes um, and maybe some of the leadership classes as CEUs. Um, but I have to input that information individually for each class that we want to try to secure some uh, CEUs for but at least push them to come down and take the classes for their own personal development as well as um, their training points that they can get through their departments. Um, if there are any changes that need to be made, I'll put that in the weekly report. If there's a, a class that's no longer available or if a uh, instructor needs to cancel their class, I'll obviously update that as needed. Um, but other than that, people are starting to register, and it's very important to register for the classes so the instructors know how many students they're going to have come class time. Of course, walk-ins are always welcome. We don't want anybody to say, oh, I didn't register, so I, don't wanna, I can't go into that class. Of course you can, but there may not be a seat if the class is full. Um, so just try to register for the classes as soon as you can. That's just classes. Thank you. And so Lynn is coordinating with the OC Fools relative to the programs we have with them. So she's that, that liaison uh, over to Jason Bloom with the Ocean City Fire Department. Uh, Bill Hildebrand reports that all of the caucus meeting rooms have been scheduled. So uh, each of the counties that do a caucus at the convention should check with him on that. A couple of program pieces. We've announced several times we will not be doing a basket bingo on Monday night. Uh, just as losing interest, it's obvious that uh, it competes with Jolly Roger. So we're going to try a year this year without it. The air show is the, will be in town, but the weekend we arrive, so we'll deal with that when we first get to Ocean City. So, of course, Coastal Highway will be crazy trying to get up to the banquet at the Clarion. It always is when the air show's in town, so you need to plan appropriately. 
Uh, we met with Jolly Roger, and they're going to continue with Family Night on Monday night, along with some discounts for the Inlet Boardwalk and Splash Mountain. So that'll continue with some of our family activities. A reminder that uh, the Town of Ocean City requires city permits on every trailer that is parked in town. So if your department is bringing a trailer in, it's got to have a permit sticker on it. Uh, the Convention Committee receives 25 stickers for our vendors and for our work teams. So Roger Steger will be getting those out uh, to the Exhibit Committee to hand those out in the Convention Center. But if your department's bringing a trailer, you got to have a permit or you're going to get ticketed and possibly towed. I had mentioned the banquet is again going to be at the Clarion. Uh, just so you know, it's no longer called the Clarion. It's the Fontainebleau Hotel. Uh, Dr. Berger sold the facility, and it's under new, new management, but uh, we've already met with them, and we're set for that. Uh, one of the big changes is exhibits. We're going to run from Sunday to Tuesday. Uh, one of the big pieces we got was the Wednesday. It's just so hard to get people in the exhibit hall. So I'm going to turn it over to Kate and Dave to talk a little about exhibits and, and where we are with... Uh, with those activities because we're doing something a little bit different this year. I guess that puts me first. <laughs> You're up, buddy. <laughs> I'm not Wally, but I did sleep in the Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I slept at home, but it sounded good. Uh, as, as everyone's aware, it's quite a bit of changes <coughs> this year in the exhibit hall uh, with, the, with the advent of the, the new C Hall. Uh, our move is to try to move as much stuff from the outside to the inside. Uh, not use what was formerly the dockside D hall, uh, but basically get everything in, into the large exhibit area. Uh, there's also been a little bit of change in the organization. Uh, I asked to be kind of relieved from the, the contracting side of, of the business, uh, and so Kate got that, and like Chief Phillips says, she's learning how deep that water is. <laughs> um, uh, because it, because it is, is quite, a, especially with having to do a, a brand new layout for the new sea hall and, and so I certainly thank Kate for everything that that that's, that she's done um, and, and and I'm sure sure it's going to turn out fine uh, but our crew is, is, is already on board ready to set up to start some preliminary work on Friday uh, do the do the uh, setup and the move in on Saturday um, and then a little bit more move in on Sunday morning before we do a, what we kind of call a soft opening on Sunday which is new to us uh, we've looked at the, the New York State Fire Chief's agenda. Uh, that typically has been kind of our, our roadblock because New York Fire Chiefs don't close until Saturday, so therefore they can't get down there to set up on Saturday. But we actually looked at it, we talked to some vendors, and uh, we don't necessarily believe it's as big a problem as maybe we thought it was. Um, a, a lot of our vendors are more local to the, to the, to the Delmarva area. Uh, yes, there are some coming from New York, and that's why we will either allow them to set up late Saturday or even Sunday morning. So, so um, we've got things in place. Our, our crew is ready to go. And with that, I'll, uh, Kate can talk more about, about uh, what, what we've done so far on, on the contracting and, and the redesign of the exhibit area. So Lynn and I have just been receiving the exhibitor registrations, logging them as they come in and placing them on our board. We have a significant amount of booth space taken already. Um, we're trying to configure, as Dave said, things that were outside, how they're going to fit inside, and if we're going to have any overflow into outside. If I, we're not, we just don't know that yet. Um, but the booths themselves are filling up quickly. Um, we're anticipating using C Hall for some booth space as well, so having some apparatus in A, B, and C. Um, so we're just kind of waiting on some little logistical pieces with some of the uh, apparatus people to see uh, how many booths we're actually going to be able to have in A, B, and C Hall. Uh, but we're progressing nicely. I mean, the, the information that's out is effective. It's reaching who it needs to reach. We've done our mail out um, to all of our post ex past exhibitors and some ones that we've reached out to when we went to the uh, Spring Expo. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got a couple of new vendors coming on board, so we're excited for that too. Uh, we're also looking at a vendor reception on Sunday afternoon that one of our apparatus vendors is looking to co-sponsor, so we may have a little bit of opportunity to meet with our vendors that it would be good for Lynn and I um, because we'll be able to meet some of the key players that come back every year uh, in that reception. So 
Um, it's, it's just moving along, and once we get some of the other footprints inside and out confirmed with our apparatus, then we'll be able to close out all of the rest of the booth, uh, exhibitors, but uh, we'll hopefully have more of that in the next couple of weeks. But Lynn, anything else? No. <laughs> Thanks, Kate, Dave. Yeah. So one of the things we're trying to do, one of the largest complaints or one of the main complaints we get every year is parking. So we're trying to do everything we can to reduce the amount of apparatus that's outside because that takes a huge amount of parking spaces. Plus, with the redesign of the convention center entrance, that whole circle that used to be out there, that's all been reconfigured. So we're really pushing to get as much of the fire apparatus outside to inside. That'll, that'll be a more draw to get people into the exhibit hall to see the other booths. And of course, it helps us in more parking spaces on site. So that's been a big piece uh, relative to that layout. We know it's new and it, you know, we're gonna have some issues along the way, but, but bear with us as we learn as we go for that as well. So I, I gotta thank them for jumping in and, and taking that and, and running with it and we appreciate all of that. Uh, the next is convention book. And Tommy, you wanna talk a little about that and some of your deadlines and? Yeah, well, as you all know, uh, after losing Danny, that's kind of uh, thrown a little uh, wrench in our operation. We've uh, pretty well been doing that project for, well, I've been doing it for 31 years, and Danny was there just about since the beginning of that. So uh, we're down from about 10 people when we started this thing 30 years ago to three. But we're working, and we're getting a lot of help out of the office in Carlton, too. So the, all the forms have been revised, and uh, thanks to Kate and the work she did on that to get that revised. All that's been mailed out, put up on the website. We're beginning to get advertisements in. Uh, now they're going to be all coming to me instead of going to Danny, and we're working with Rose to, uh, to, to keep uh, all that that comes in the mail uh, up to date. And I picked up... Um, uh, a new person that's going to come on and try to help if we get you know bogged down with that. Uh, for the reports, uh, for all the committees, and maybe uh, we might want to send out a reminder to everybody, uh, they need to be to Jenny by May 1st so she can have those prepared for when we do the, uh, the paste up uh, for the book uh, in the middle of May. So anybody, any committee that has a report to put in the program book, we need it by May 1st. Uh, sooner. If, if it's available, is better for us. Uh, ads are the same way. If we, we have the ads by, by May 1st, we'll be in uh, pretty good shape, I think, so we have time to go to the printer and get that done. Uh, with that, uh, the team backstage that uh, does all the magic with all this equipment, they're pretty well up to speed with everything they have to do, uh, looking at some, some new equipment, possibly. Uh, not sure if we'll get it this year or not, but. Uh, they, they always do a great job. So everybody back there um, is doing a, will be doing uh, the routine that they do every year, and uh, they do a great job with it. Uh, that's pretty well where we are. Uh, any questions about that? So if any of you have, uh, know of any folks who want to put ads in, uh, commercial ads from people in the community, they may want to congratulate the fire service on uh, what they're doing. Uh, get them to us by May 1st, and we'll plug them in the book. Any questions? Okay, thanks, Tommy. As Tommy said, we're really sad at the loss of past president Danny Davis. Danny's been involved with the convention committee as a, a co-chair for many years. So I, I'll put this call out again. The convention committee is looking for people to be a part of it. We, we hear people want to be engaged, so please reach out to us. We're looking for new members of the convention committee to kind of take on some of these projects. So if you're interested, please reach out. Uh, the convention committee did, uh, steering committee did make its first site visit to Ocean City on February 23rd, walked through the convention center, got a lot of ideas on, on things that we can and can't do. Also participated in both the Annapolis and Ocean City St. Patrick's Day event, so that was kind of cool. Relative to the program itself, and this is the part that uh, everyone should have gotten a copy of this, hard copy this morning, all the executive committee. So you'll see that... Uh, the first uh, piece that uh, is, is important to discuss is the voting component. So the first balloting for voting is going to be on Monday, right after the first session. 
And the reason is if we have to have two sets of balloting, we needed to build a, a vote on Monday and a vote on Tuesday. So you'll see that uh, right after the nominations of, of officers, it's on page two at the top, the appointment of election judges and tellers will occur and voting will occur right after that session. And then we'll go into second session and voting ends at three o'clock on Monday. And the report of the election judges will be at uh, 3.30. And then on Tuesday, if there is a need for a second ballot on whether it's the bylaws amendments or the election, eight o'clock Tuesday morning will be the second ballot for voting. And that will end at 10 o'clock on Tuesday with the announcement before we break uh, Tuesday afternoon. The Secretary's office has, has met with the convention committee on a pool somewhere back there. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do everything we can for the electronic voting. So people who are delegates need to be registered and present to vote. It's what's in the bylaws, and I'm sure Richard could jump in on that at any time. Registered and present. And so we're going to do the same process when it's time to vote, when the balloting opens, every registered delegate chair will receive an email with their ballots. And then each company that gets five votes, past presidents, officers that get their votes, that'll be sent out electronically, and then we'll have two hours to fill those ballots out and send them back in. If someone is in Ocean City and doesn't have a smartphone, so they can't answer their emails on their, on their phone, or forgot it, there will be 10 voting stations set up by the data committee in probably past president's room, somewhere in, in the convention center, where they could go in, open up their email account, get their email of the ballots, cast their five ballots if they're a department or single ballot if they're a past president or officer, and then cast them that way. So we've made every accommodation to do the electronic voting as best as possible, but it's critical that people understand the bylaws say you have to be registered, which means you have to have checked in with your credentials, and you have to be present. It means you've had to physically been in Ocean City. It's the only difference from how we voted last year. Because last year people could vote from home or wherever they were. So we're just trying to make sure, again, Richard, did I miss anything? Just want to make sure people understand that's going to be very critical. Registered and present. Mr. President, question? Yes, I've been asked, um, you know, you've registered the first time when you go in. And do you have to be present for the second round of voting? The second round of voting will be done the same way. There's another round that needs to be done. In other words, if on Monday there is a dispute relative to two candidates or the bylaws, the reason we wanted to end the voting at three o'clock before the convention ended, so we could start spreading the word, there's gonna be another balloting in the morning. And that there's gonna be massive amounts of email, social media, and blasts to all of the registered delegates so they know there'll be a second voting the next morning. The second voting the next morning will go the same way. An email blast starting at 8 o'clock to all of the delegate chairs who've registered for their department, and then they'll vote just like they did the day before. Correct, but Tuesday, do they actually have to be present Tuesday, or do they just have to be present Monday for the first round? Um, when they register. Right. Like if they go home Monday. So the... I'll, probably a wrong word, but the assumption is that they've been there and checked in at that desk, then they're registered and they're present. All right, and I'll be very candid. I'm not going to go see if they're voting from secrets, <laughs> nor is the secretary's office. Or the court bar. But they've checked in, okay. and so they're, they're present in Ocean City, I guess is the best way to put that. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. I have, uh, on the voting, so companies are submitting the credentials at this point, which right. is the due date is May 31st. If, if something changes, if they've already submitted and their delegates change, do they have to redo another credentialing form? 
If so, is there the system allowing you to do that because you've already submitted your first one? Here he comes. And I think the answer is yes, but I'll let him answer that question. Yes. If a, <clears throat> excuse me, if a uh, department company has submitted uh, credentials online, okay, and they need to make a change, they need to go in and resubmit. And it allows you to do that. Yes. Okay. But, you know, there's, but. there's always a but. <laughs> you know. It's going to crack. Okay. See what I'm saying. Yeah, but when they go yeah. in, make sure that they correct all the information and it goes back into through the normal channel. So, so does all member companies realize that? Yes, they do. They, a lot of is them. That, is that, hold up, no. question I have is, is it stated currently on the credentialing form no. that every member company knows to go back and redo a second credentialing? No. Only if there's a change. Only if they don't know that. They're just thinking they'll send their alternate. So now, what will happen? As we, and we just talked about this earlier. If there is a change, and we're going to send out a blast to all uh, departments okay. to indicate that this is what's got to take place, if your del uh, chairman of the delegation cannot be there. Okay. Okay. I, I've been questioned by all three of my counties. That's why I wanted the answer. There was also a discussion that, and, and I know we've talked, <coughs> we've got to work it out. But the critical piece is the person who uh, checks in at registration at, as, as yes. the delegate. And, and I'll, I'll use Doug Guire. He's, he always represents United Communities. If Doug can't make it and somebody else goes in, the registration table says, well, wait a minute, you're not Doug. What's going on? And then we've got to work that out because that email address for United Communities is going to Doug. So the critical one is the, is the, is the delegate chair. Sure. Right, right. If, if, you yeah. change, if you change your alternates, uh, it would be good uh, to have uh, it up there. Absolutely. It's not critical. Thank you. Right. But the Thank delegate you. chair. That's the delegate right. chair, delegate chair, chair, delegate chair, chair is the one that's going to get is, that is the most important. Okay. Right. Okay. Your delegate chair is the one that's going to be receiving the, the ballots. Okay. The email. Got yeah. it. Question. The yes. The register, the person doing the registration, are they going to just verify the email to make sure it is correct? Well, no, uh, okay. they don't need to. That's because fine. Fine. Now, let me explain. Between now and June, there will be several emails sent out to the delegation to make sure that their email address has, uh, is correct, that they are receiving the information, and, uh, yeah, come back to us. Because uh, I have probably 100 and, say, 200 uh, uh, credentials in now. And I've already sent out and corrected uh, several uh, typos, not only on my part when I transfer it over to the uh, spreadsheet, but also their part. Uh, and you can pick up the uh, uh, fairly easily if you see a typo, you know it's not in there. Anyone else? Correct. So because they need the ballot. For, for right. So you can register because it won't take just because you're a delegate. You've got to be listed as the person who's the chairman of that delegation. Correct. And also to discuss at that time when the delegate was changed, you had to register in person if there is a second ballot also. Then uh, well, <laughs> there's another part to so, this. So that's what you had said earlier. That's right. Uh, what we had said earlier has changed okay. to a degree because now the uh, uh, people at the registration is, can make some modifications. Okay. Yeah, and this is what's going to be coming out to the, uh, all, everybody reference to uh, the uh, credentials. Like, from that first meeting I'm talking about, it sounds like now it's a mixed message. And I don't want to yeah, but it has changed something. Right. Thank you. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. So we are or we are not 
if there is a second ballot? Does that person have to go back? Because Ron just said the assumption was they were there right. because they registered. So that was the first they, assumption we had. So. Right. I don't think there's anything, Mr. Brooks, is, is there anything in the bylaws? <laughs> yes. When, when we had the discussion, it was if they came in on Sunday and checked in at the registration desk. They were there. And they were there. They were, they were present and registered. And that, that I'm not aware of a need for them to come back to the registration desk to vote on Tuesday. That's the way I understood. Can I, can I go back? Can I go back to my earlier statement? Because I have to have some faith in the integrity of the delegate, right? And I realize that that may be a stretch, but that's where we are. When they come in and think about this, because we went through this several years ago when people called for a roll call vote. Oh yeah. Alright? <laughs> yeah. Y'all or some of you remember. So the issue is when they sign in, they are there. They are credentialed by virtue of the fact that their company has sent in their credentials list. Two of the three have now been accomplished and then they're going to vote. Right? And those are the three those are the three components in the bylaws that we have to meet, my opinion, right? That we have to meet. If that falls to Tuesday, they're still there. They're still credentialed, they're still registered, and they're going to be there to, to, to vote. I was here too. Uh, I just have to clarify what Bill says. Oh. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so <laughs> that being said, yeah, so other questions on voting? Let's, let's get that piece out of the way. No, um, Tom was just saying, is there going to be something at, like when you register, it says, all right, in the, in the chance of a possibility of a second vote on Tuesday, you will be getting a second, you know, make sure you watch your emails. So, that, so it's there going to be a handout so the person who's picking up their packet or registering is going to know that there could be a possibility of getting another email on Tuesday if necessary. Well, you mean the second mail. Right. Yeah, the um, emails and the assumption is that there will be a second ballot <coughs> Tuesday. So in the mail out, um, everything that's going to go out, it's going to be stated in there that be ready for a possible yeah. second uh, ballot. So, so what, what, we're, what we're saying is that when, when I, I go in there as my delegation, I vote, hand me a piece of paper saying, here's the, here's the next possible ballot vote at such and such a time or such and such a day. Because, quite frankly, how many people read that full mail out? That no, no, no. no. So These will be going out by email. Uh, to, well, that's yeah. probably even worse. <laughs> that's why they're going to get but the ballot. I'm just, so. I'm just thinking that if, when, they mail, when they come in and vote the first time, when they walk out of there, give them a piece of paper, tell them tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock there's a possibility for a second ballot, a second vote. And then they know it. They, they're on vacation. They're not looking at emails all day long. Uh, it's just a thought, but I Take think it. it's going to be Take very confusing. Right. Yeah. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. All right. Any other questions on voting? Okay. The only other piece that's a major change to the convention program is we are not going to hold a golf tournament on Friday. Love to, but just the costs, and it just has been a, a not a profit-bearing adventure. So those are the major changes to this program. So Mr. Chair, I, I turn that piece over to you as an action item. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion we, I'll make a motion we accept the preliminary program for the 130th annual convention. Second. <laughs> We understand. I have a motion by Dayton, I second by Kerry.
to accept a preliminary program for the 130th Annual Convention and Conference of the Maryland State Firemen's Association. Thank you. Any questions? All those, oh, Kate. No, no, no. Oh. When you go like that, my wife has said, when I go like that, you pay attention. Okay, she did that. Nope. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Who's no? Thank aye. you. You're welcome. So the last last thing is uh, uh, one of the other major changes is the ladies will be meeting in D hall, not in the pack. Uh, we've worked out with uh, the president to have the old style meeting that they had a long thin room. Uh, they're going to go back to D hall, so we've been able to to work that out with them. So we appreciate those changes. Uh, ben, anything else on program? I think, Ken, anything good. that you want to add? Um, We're good. <laughs> it's a Bobby, anything on finance? Nope. And uh, Randy's not here. Uh, just one more thing. Uh, just be aware that the hotels that are participating in discounted uh, rates this year, five so far have been listed on the uh, convention website as of today. Uh, we're working with past president Denver to uh, obtain more. Uh, we just haven't gotten the rest of that list. So there's at least five and then our host hotel is the Grand. So. Okay. Questions? That, any questions? Thank you, group. Appreciate Thank it. You. Administrative branch, Mr. Lee Lutz. Thank you. Uh, looking for Doug, uh, Dave Lewis, and Laura Woods for any report. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Lee Lutz, uh, Administrative Branch. We'll uh, start off with the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. President, officers, chairman, and members of the executive committee. My name is Doug Ware, chair of the Constitution Bylaws. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, mention uh, the committee. This past year is relatively quiet, except for the name change issues. However, that being said, uh, today I received a proposal to a change in the bylaws. I checked with the parliamentarian and also with our secretary, and they both agreed that we're in the time frame limit. That being said, uh, I believe you all have a copy of the change that's being recommended, and it's coming from Western Enterprise Volunteer Fire Company. And it has to deal with the number of members of the executive committee. Okay. The existing in the bylaws is that the immediate past president who shall be ex officiate member and 12 appointed members shall constitute the executive committee. The recommendation from Western Enterprise is the executive com committee members shall be appointed with the provision that no more than one appointed member shall be from any one county represented in the association. If there's any questions, I would like to turn it over to the author, past president, Rick Blair, to receive any questions on his proposal. Rick, you have the floor if you want to explain what we're doing here for um, the proposed bylaw amendment, uh, Article 4, Section 16. Okay, a number of years ago, I uh, entertained change from Washington County, Frederick County to, to make equal membership. One from Washington, one from Frederick. Since that didn't pass, so I, we come back with uh, the change to add one from every county. One individual to represent 
each county. That way everybody is, can be heard, understand what's going on within the association. Thank you. That way everybody can understand what's going on with the association and be apprised of what, what is being offered throughout the state. Right now, a lot of these county companies, excluding, well not excluding uh, Worsing County, but, uh, use the wrong word. Worsing County uh, is, uh, feels that it's not getting its fair share of information. I personally, myself, feel that they're not getting the personal uh, contacts with our delegate. And that's the reason why this is being put in. So anybody in St. Mary's County, Charles County, you know, those there's three counties down there that has one delegate. Are they being getting the same treatment that Washington and Frederick County is getting. Washington and Frederick County has something like 56 companies for one guy. Do you think it's fair to the members of those companies not being able to hear what's coming from the state level? That's my, my theory behind this. And so, so to break it down, it'll be one representative from each of the 23 counties yes. in the state of Maryland, excluding Baltimore City. Correct. Unless okay. ba Baltimore City decides to go volunteer. Well, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> okay, understood. Okay, thank you. Doug, go ahead. Okay, uh, that's the end of my report for this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. All right, Grants Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Executive Committee. Uh, again, uh, the Grants Committee primary responsibility is to look out uh, for, for the departments relative to what we call the FEMA Big Three grant programs, uh, the Assistance to Firefighter Grant Program, uh, the Safer Grant Program, and the Fire Prevention and Safety Grant Program. Uh, the FY21 cycle closed uh, earlier this year and those applications for all three grant programs are currently going through the peer review process. I can tell you I've spent a, a week reviewing AFG. I'm gonna spend next week actually reviewing more of AFG because they aren't all done yet. Uh, two weeks ago, I was up at National Fire Academy reviewing safer grant applications. Those aren't all done yet, so we're gonna be working through those. And then we've got a week at the end of April for fire prevention and safety. So all three of those grant programs are currently going through the peer review process. Uh, certainly anticipate uh, it, it would have been a good year for everybody if they had needs uh, to get in because there actually was more money uh, because part of the American Rescue Plan uh, put an extra $90 billion into AFG, an extra $10 million into FPNS, and an extra $200 million in SAFER. So we're looking at probably the higher number of applications, num higher number of awards. Uh, we don't expect that any awards will be announced probably until sometime in May because we do have to get through the peer review process. And then uh, because it is this FY21 money, uh, they actually are required to uh, submit all awards by the end of September. So even though that application period is closed, I would say now is a great time for all departments that have needs for those programs to begin planning for the next application period, likely to begin probably October, November. Uh, not anticipated that we're going to look at any serious changes for FY 2022 uh, because again the program is that far behind to make changes to the background stuff that has to get done to change the application process it just just would slow it down even more so uh, the big thing is make sure that your your SAM number uh, your FEMA GO registrations are all current and that you begin collecting the data that's needed for, for those application processes uh, middle of April, actually, uh, uh, those that are familiar with the process, the DUNS number actually goes away. Uh, DUNS is controlled by a third-party site and not by the government, so it's kind of felt like 
it, it, it was something that they needed to get away from. Uh, actually, as part of your SAM registration now, there will be a unique identifier number assigned to you as part of the SAM process, and, and that will take a place of what used to be the, the, the DUNS number. So, but SAM and FEMA GO still are, are a little bit of an obstacle, a little bit of cumbersome. Some people have difficulty getting through that, and we try to help people wherever we can get through that. Uh, I just kind of say, remember that application awards are based on need and not wants. Uh, I can tell you, reviewing a lot of applications, it's clearly some people don't read the, the program guidance and don't they, they just figure there's money out there that I'm going to go to the FEMA ATM machine and they're going to give me the magical PIN number and we're going to get those awards. It really has to be made in need. Make sure that you understand that you have to justify what you're requesting and that you have the data to support that need. So. A, a lot of applications fail. I've had an opportunity to uh, deliver grant workshops not only in Maryland but other parts of the country and, and that's a big thing that we do push. So uh, the committee is, is, is continues to be available to help anybody understand the process and help 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 there. No, we will not write your grants, but we'll certainly provide you technical advice. That's our report. Is there any questions? Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Can I go back to the chairman of the bylaws committee? This this bylaw, the way it's written, okay. What else is that going to affect? That we're only if if this changes, what else in the bylaw bylaws that we presently have is this going to affect that we're not looking at? Well, to be candor, I just received this today. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I know that's... And uh, so to give you a qualified answer, I'm going to have to research and go through the current bylaws. At, at this moment, uh, I do not foresee it affecting, but it's strictly with the executive what committee. What about the quorum? Pardon me? What about a quorum? What, I mean, would it affect well, a what quorum, constitutes you know, a quorum? It's a majority. I mean, I'm just thinking. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm it's, just a, it's a good question because you quorum, you know, you have to have a percentage or majority attending. Then it'll be up to the chair to make that decision. Do we have a quorum? It will definitely inc increase the quorum number needed. That's for sure. As he said, he just got this today. Give him time to let him walk through the bylaws. We, <laughs> Laura. Well, this is the first time I've ever gotten up here to say anything, but I'm a little upset today because when I go around and want people to stop talking or whatever they're doing, they're ignoring it. And I'm, I'm here for the reason to be quiet so these people can hear and get what they need for whatever committee or whatever it is they, they need. So please. Don't stand around here and every time I say be quiet, <laughs> laugh and all like this, because that's not what I'm here for. Yes, ma'am, point taken. Anything else, Lee? I think that's it, sir. Very well. The awards branch, Chip, Joel. The, yes, uh, the awards, you know, the Hall of Fame has uh, got their report in. Uh, nominations are coming in uh, for that. Uh, the Shimer Award uh, goes down to the last uh, few days. Uh, everything's running fine. But on the, one of the biggest things is the certificates. You know, 90 years of age and uh, 50 years of service or whatever. Yeah, there's a certificate that can be given out to the individual uh, departments and individuals uh, themselves. For example, you know, if uh, you're the top responder in fire or EMS, just go on there, look at the uh, certificates request, and uh, fill it out, submit it, and we'll get a uh, certificate into them. But overall, um, nothing will happen on the awards until basically the week before. Very good. Thank you, sir. Anybody else, Chip? That's good. Information technology, Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I 
check with my committee chairs and uh, from brother Rich Snader stated that there will be no more Zoom capability for these meetings. Uh, they will be br broadcast on YouTube and if any remote participants wants to ask a question or have any input, there is a chat feature on YouTube that they're able to use and will be recognized here and they'll be included in the meeting. Other than that, uh, that was the end of uh, both of those groups. Thank you. Thank you. Strategic initiative, Steve. Oh, where are you? Maybe a little boys room. I'm going to keep jumping. Public information, Tim. Ronnie's here. He submitted his report electronically. I'll let him speak. And Jonathan's here. Frank's here, too. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Public Relations Committee has not met specifically as a full committee any time, but I do speak often to the different members individually about what we're doing. You got my report, it was sent in. I have attended several different functions and activities of our member companies throughout the state. And I'm glad to see that many, many more are starting to use the various media ends to advertise their own things that are going on. Not only their fundraisers, but their fire prevention activities. Um, seeing quite a bit of that more, and I'm glad to see that. That's the type of thing, because people are, that's what people are looking at. You can put the sign in front of your fire station all you want to, and after the first two or three times people drive by there, they don't even notice it. It's just another sign to look at. But they look at the computers, they look at the stuff that comes up. And it's a good idea to make sure your people know that they can use those media. They don't cost you anything. Use that media to advertise your activities. We're getting better weather coming up. More companies are going to be hosting their activities and doing more stuff now, trying to get out and get things going on in communities. Take the time to let your local communities know what your activities are, what you're going to be doing, so they can support you. If there's anything we can do as a public relations committee to help you with ideas or just help you get your word out, please contact me. That's all I have. Well, I'm happy to report that most firehouses are staying out of trouble, so I don't have a lot. My biggest thing is people call me because they're writing a eulogy for somebody and they want to know what year, so I have to go back and scan through the books and find out and hopefully they get it within 10 years because their uncle Fred was a member on such and such committee and they've got to put stuff on the eulogy. And that's what I do. And lately it's been pretty daggone busy. So as you can imagine, I've been doing roughly three funerals a week. And, and unbelievable, more women are passing away than men at this point. We, we are part of the baby boomers age so we can expect more deaths over the next so many years. Anybody that's 60, 70, or 80 is a baby boomer. So when good old Uncle Fred passes away, just give me a call and tell me what committee's about what year and I'll look it up for you. That's it. There's not a whole lot going on with the uh, volunteer trumpet committee itself. It's not really met as a full committee, however, still looking for information and education and submission of articles. Um, there is about a three to four week lapse in the time that I submit the trumpet to the press, the press will turn around and get it printed and then shipped out to you. Um, so the best source of information is the website. Um, I had submitted both of them a couple weeks ago. One was uploaded, one was lost in translation. So it will be uploaded here shortly. Um, there's two editions. The newest editions are back to back within about a week period. Reason being was there was so much material for this um, particular edition that instead of having a 30 page edition we decided to split it up into two um, and the second one has highlighted features of um, some members that have just passed also the candidates for second VP some of their bios introductions and happy birthday to Sparky so um, we're just considering a, a special edition for that nature other than that anyone that wants to uh, send any information my way please do so uh, yeah, we will have one more before we That's all. Thank you all. Thank you very much.
Transportation, Robbie, anything for um, the group? Wayne Tome. Wayne's, he Wayne's and here. Mitch. And Mitch. President vehicle. Same which. I was going to say thank you, Mr. Chairman, but he disappeared again. Actually, my chairman disappeared, so I don't see vice chair. Um, we talked this morning. I know we're going to do an inventory today of the uh, presidential vehicles, uh, actually all four vehicles, and do an uh, inventory of the mileage on them. Uh, as far as I know, everything's on the road. The oil changes are getting done on time, and uh, maintenance is being taken care of. So everything's good with the presidential vehicles. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, from transportation, Frank Underwood keeps me uh, straight. And the day-to-day operations in the backbone is Lynn and uh, Key. Um, we do have a, a girl now at MVA that's very responsive. Uh, we've had some trouble with uh, telework, which means in some agencies, no work. So we're up and running. I uh, thought smoothly until Kate told me you need to go talk to me. So uh, we have a couple issues that the committee is going to be dealing with, and that entails the presidential uh, plates where they had the year on there or just the, the two-digit number. They're kind of hinting to us that they may not do that, so we're going to get a meeting together. Uh, they may not do those anymore. Uh, so we may need some pressure put on, but we'll let you know about that. And also getting the records from MBA when we do our renewals. They're, for privacy issues, I guess they're a little timid about giving us, you know, a, a, an information dump. So we're going to have to finesse that, maybe a business services agreement where we sign off and say, you know, like men, we, you know, with the emeds, we won't say anything and disclose any information, otherwise you can, you know, throw us in jail or something. Um, but uh, the committee, well, I've taken on uh, the easy pass issues. A lot of the easy passes out there are old. If you have the square easy passes in your fire equipment, get them changed out. Uh, we um, are trying to get on a DoDOT pursue list in Cecil County with Delaware and any other border companies need to try to pursue with the easy pass to get on a do not pursue list. Well, I thought I was on a roll. I went up to Delaware Easy Pass and met two people who lived in Port Deposit, and I said, I'm in Lake Flint. Well, then it stopped at their supervisor. He hasn't returned my calls or emails, so, but we did successfully, two companies got some fines where they were playing catch up like they are in the state of Maryland. They were getting fines for Easy Pass usage, and all we did was call, and they waived the fines and took them all off. So you just have to, um, if, if it's Delaware, let me know. If your folks get bills, don't pay them. We got some contacts that we can get you, you know, off their uh, pursuit list. And uh, CDL licensing, I received some inquiries from companies that are still going through the licensing for CDL or even non-CDL getting appointments. Um, they, uh, we have a contact. We can speed that up a little bit. Uh, there is a class now for CDL licensing, which is rather expensive from what we understand. It's a federal st standard, but we do have the mechanism for the red cards in Maryland. So, you know, basically it's deference to the red card system. We have a system to be able to allow the folks to drive fire engines. If you want to go above and beyond that, you may have to send them to a class to get a CDL if you're going to require that above and beyond what the uh, state requires as far as the red, pro red card program. Still seeing some old MSFA logo plates out there. Either those people haven't been in fire companies for a while or, uh, you know, they, they've uh, been discharged from fire companies. If there is anyone that has been discharged from a fire company that hadn't moved to another affiliation and a company wants to see that person's tags pulled, send us a letter and we'll see what we can do to have a notice sent by MBA to try to pull those tags, but that's that's uh, a tough nut. Um, and then, of course, when you're filling out the forms, please pull the forms off the website so they're the most accurate form and get the fire company name, legal name, and the NFERS number for your company. That's how we're tracking uh, company affiliations. and. Uh, send the forms in after you get your local 
company signature and the county coordinator. Do you have anything else? Nope, we covered it all. Right. Any questions? Any questions for the transportation man? Uh, just one question. Yeah. Any progress on the uh, Easy Pass tags for MSFA vehicles? Still working. <clears throat> Haven't heard a word yet. All right. I'm going to see if he what his contact is. I might go that route. Yeah, because I just heard he said he had a contact. Yeah, Delaware. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, this is going to be pretty short because just about everything that we discussed at the uh, Strategic Initiatives Committee has already been reported on. The Safer Grant Committee, uh, Director Loveless did a bang-up job reporting on that. Uh, also, uh, the, the increase in the uh, income tax subtraction modification that's uh, also been discussed by Bob, Bob Phillips uh, that will start probably to increase in the year 2023. Um, we discussed, uh, uh, the, the president brought, brought out about the, uh, the gap grant type uh, funding for uh, people who need uh, construction of, of fire stations. Um, and I think that's, that's really about it. Uh, everybody else basically did my job for me in their reports and I thank them for that and that's all my report was submitted online good uh, chip any um, risk management update no we have our renewals have all gone through we, I think all the cars are updated we're okay there uh, we'll need to get with the convention committee with respect to the um, hot training it's been a couple years since we've done that we need to make sure we get the certificates from the OC full skip for that that's the only thing that we ahead of time want to make sure we got that and the 16 year old sign offs and all but it's been a couple years since we've done it so we'll follow up on that thank you thank you thank you very much um members benefits buddy report up here um my job also was uh done partially for me but just to highlight a few things um we reported that we do have a new R and R coordinator for the state. Um, we also have regional coordinator in Dale and one higher base from Shore. Hopefully, to have the uh, Southern Maryland and Western Maryland here feel very soon. Boot camp is coming up on March 26th and 27th. I want to personally thank Kate and the team for um, putting together such a, a, an event in a very quick um, turnaround period. It is great to see that we have 115 uh, individuals signed up, which is absolutely fantastic, and I'm excited to. Uh, attend and hear some of the speakers that are happening that day. Um, included in my report also is the summary of that event. Of course, you can find all the information online as well. Also, the change in the Maryland Volunteer Weekend, of course, because of Easter, um, is now moved to the 23rd and 24th. It's important to note that the boot camp falls previous to the um, Maryland Volunteer Weekend. Reason being um, for the short turnaround period was to train the r, &R coordinators at the department level. Um, so they have the information to take back to their department to put and implement on the 23rd and 24th of April. Also, my report, too, is um, one of our social media accounts. Um, I don't report on all of them, although I could. Um, one of the accounts started back at our R&R &R weekend in Emmonsburg was TikTok. Um, ironically enough, um, not many people follow our social media accounts and we would look at the analytics, um, look at what's behind the scenes, how many people that's really impacted. Um, but I'm particularly proud of this particular account because we have 3,800 followers in about the seventh or eighth month period. Many people might think, well, who are those followers? Are they from Maryland? Are they um, from another part of the country? And actually, uh, very many of them are from Maryland. Um, I've received several different comments on a lot of our content and media saying that, hey, that's my department, or hey, I'm signed up to be a volunteer. I'm taking Fire One class in a couple months. So. Uh, the work that we are doing, um, not just myself, but uh, Kate and her team, uh, getting the content out there on Facebook and other social media accounts has been very effective um, at not only recruitment, but also retention as well. Um, with that being said, we will reconvene uh, as a full committee um, following the boot camp to take a, do a kind of a hot wash of uh, the activities that weekend. If there's any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Hearing none, thank you. 
Good. I uh, also have the scholarship committee's report it was scheduled online. Uh, once again, um, uh, little R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center is pleased to able to sponsor MSA scholarship fund this year. We would like to donate $2,500 from Becky Gilmore. And they're also picking up past presidents, pay attention. They're picking up your food bill for your past president's dinner. As they generally do. One more quick comment. Um, the 2022 NVFC R&R experience is being held in Mesa, Arizona this year. Uh, Past President Lewis is in the room to report on that, but it is happening. It will be in person. I attended the first um, first uh, conference that they have held for r and in uh, Ohio last year. Fantastic event. It is, um, registration is online. It is $129. However, there are some stipends available. And also, uh, Past President Denver and I have been in contact with the Reaching the Next Generation Committee. Um, he unfortunately is uh, sick this weekend and cannot attend um, today, but however, we are working together, both the R&R committee and that committee to uh, put together some plans for the rest of the year. Thank you. Past President Bilger. Mr. Chair, if I may, I'd like to go back to the past president's report real quick. I want to personally thank, on behalf of the past presidents and the Davis family for all of the past presidents and the members of the MSFA state partners and all who attended either the viewing or the funeral of past President Davis. I would also like to ask everyone to keep in your thoughts uh, past President Fred Cross. He's currently in rehab. He had a partial hip replacement done and some work done to his elbow. I'm sure he would appreciate a card or a uh, phone call from uh, members uh, just checking in on him. But again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Good. Thank you, sir. Kate? Mr. Chair, just wanted to let you know, we do have, um, and I was going to talk to Jonathan on the side until he brought <coughs> up, the Reaching the Next Gen. Um, we do have funding in the SAFER grant to do an MSFA recruitment uh, video. So we have done recruitment videos for our departments and for our counties. But uh, after talking with John at the Spring Expo, we thought it might be a good idea to use the SAFER funds to create an MSFA recruitment video. Um, we're always looking for new members to step up and run some of these committees and join some of these committees and learn more about the inner workings of the MSFA. So um, Jonathan will get that information with uh, John Denver and hopefully by the end of the year we'll have a nice MSFA video to share and boost some uh, involvement across the state. So thank you. Very well. LOSAP committee, Rick. I uh, just want to report on two things. Uh, first of all, obviously, we're collecting the data from all the different counties in order to put it together to um, submit to the comptroller. Deadlines are the same as last year. Anybody has any questions, they can contact me and I can work it out. Also, we are updating the LOSAP uh, PDF that's on the website that hasn't been updated since 2017. Should have it done next week uh, that shows any changes to anybody's LOSAP processes over the, since 2017. Very good. Okay. Buddy, I have um, Teresa um, to speak for cancer support. Is that on your... I had that. I just got the name from the president. Um, Teresa, any comments for the cancer support committee? She gone? She be gone. All right. All right. Let... Cindy, run, 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 Cindy, Cindy. On behalf of Teresa, who had to go to a banquet, um, there will be a cancer walk. She is finalizing that. Um, the cancer support committee is in transition. Is that a fair statement, Kate? <laughs> the cancer support committee is in transition. There are a number of things that will happen over the next four months, and I think she can give you a better fill-in next tomorrow, but there will be a cancer support walk. I believe it will still be April 24th. There will not need to be pre-registration. It will be a donation on site. And those are all the details she shared with me. More tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. At this time, is there any other partners to the MSFA who cannot make tomorrow's meeting would like to speak now? Any other speakers wish to come forward? 
All right, folks, um, I will declare this session um, over and ask for the benediction, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Gentlemen, coat and tie. I will have to check with management. Um, go ahead, John. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to pray. Your respect. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this day, for this gathering together, for the knowledge that's been shared and the work that's been accomplished. Father, as we get ready to depart this evening, we ask for continued prayer, uh, prayers for those who are not with us today, who are sick or, or injured. And Father, we ask continued prayers for those who are serving their communities, answering the calls, protect and guide them, and give those who are not coming back safe travels. And we ask this all in your son's name. Amen.